spiked out I could trip a referee Tell by my attitude That I most definitely leave from All right, everybody, we're back. We're back. It's This Week in Startups, episode number 39, Twist, the hashtag of the show. If you're watching live, pound T-W-I-S-T. If you're watching live, you're watching live on Ustream.tv, which raised $75 million this week. Did you see that? I saw that. Masa-san. You're throwing the coin down, throwing down the yen. Whoa. <laughs> uh, Masa does not play around. We love, uh, we, uh, we love SoftBank, and congratulations. We love Ustream, yep. and uh, congratulations to those guys. They've been crushing it, and holy cow, a $75 million investment around, and going into China big time streaming video is for real, clearly for real. And we had a big week. Yeah. Uh, we made a trip, first trip, I think. I, this is the first trip since I had the kid? Yep. Yeah, pretty much. It is. Uh, I took a day trip up for the crunchies. Yep. Uh, but we went to Boulder. Right. Uh, which is a nice community for the Open Angel Forum. Uh, you guys remember, fans of the show, that we, you might remember there was this Koretsu Forum thing, and there was a gun involved, and there was an ultimatum. We gave them an ultimatum. Listen, you guys need to stop charging startups to present. And that went pretty well, some press for it. And we told them, in a very reasonable way, the Koretsu Forum, which was an angel investor angel investing forum stop charging startups to pitch no pay to pitch and uh, we were totally reasonable we said very simply stop charging and put an apology on your website which I thought was pretty reasonable yeah or not I mean <laughs> I don't know how I would take it if somebody just said it <laughs> can you please put an apology <laughs> on your website uh, but anyway we we backed it up we said if they don't do it right we'll do it um, we did open angel forum last month in Los Angeles and then Wow, uh, yesterday, uh, Wednesday night, we had Boulder launch the Open Angel Forum, openangelforum.com. Everybody knows what openangelforum.com is. It's essentially 15, 20 angel investors of note who've made three or four investments, uh, and they will uh, hear pitches from five companies. Over 100 applied in LA, over 100 applied in Boulder, five presented. Uh, the ones that were in the LA event, I think I'm going to invest in two of them. I can't announce it yet, but you can probably do the math. Uh, and now in Boulder, I may invest in one of those companies. It's three out of the ten I think I'm going to wind up investing in. I, I don't have that much money to invest in all these things. <laughs> I need to start a venture capital firm. <laughs> <laughs> it's problematic because I wanted to do ten deals a year, yeah. and we did three, in, three or four in the first month. So uh, we got a problem, a good problem, I guess. Uh, but Open Angel Forum, coming to other cities, we're so lucky to have it in Boulder with uh, David Cohen, who runs Techstars. Techstars is like an incubator program. You should totally check that out. If you're an entrepreneur, that's a great way to start your career off. Techstars.com. And Brad Feld, who is a great venture capitalist. He's B. Feld on, um, on Twitter. And David is David Cohen on Twitter. And Brad Feld's dad is uh, S. Feld. Yes. So his dad's on Twitter, and he doesn't understand it. It's, it's pretty funny. Anyway, we have a video. Somebody made a video of it. And... Um, they did a very good job with it, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to play that in a second. Um, but you know who else is doing a good job? I, you yep, do. I, I wonder if he does. Do you know? <laughs> no, Scott, you on what front? But don't worry about it. <laughs> uh, the person who's doing a great job is Bing. Microsoft's Bing, of course, sponsoring the show, sponsoring the Perfect Pitch Contest. You must submit your pitch for Jason Shark Tank by February 16th. You will be chosen to pitch between January 22nd and February 19th. That means any of these shows, any of the previous shows between that period. Winner is going to get a half day of free PR consulting from the Seattle-based ad agency Creature. And that's probably worth about 10 Gs, 10 large, one full high society, one entry into the World Series of Poker main event. Uh, for those of you who count things uh, in the same denomination I do. It's a lot of I mochas do. in my world. In Tyler's world, <laughs> it's a lot of mochas. In my world, it's one entry into the World Series of Poker. Right. Five, how many mochas is that? 2,000 mochas. Yeah. It's either 2,000 mochas or one entry into the World Series of Poker. And, uh, yeah, Tyler and I and Lon will pick the winner, uh, and then we'll announce that on February 26th. Uh, Bing has got you covered. Uh, they are going to be giving cash back on Valentine's Day. And uh, when you order from their top merchants, uh, you'll get 25% uh, back from Teleflora, 30% uh, back from ProFlowers, 25% back from 1-800-Flowers. you got to send your girl, your mom, your grandma. you got to send flowers uh, and... 
You get cash back when you do that through Bing, and that's pretty cool. Also, search for Super Bowl 44 for uh, stats this Sunday. It's the Super Duper Bowl, uh, and they launched this Twitter Maps, which is pretty cool. I pulled it up on my screen. You can do a search and then see where those things are coming from. So I just did a search for Pound Twist, and um, there are some people who used it in the last couple of days, and I can go click around and see who is tweeting what about uh, Twist. Pretty cool feature, uh, Bing constantly innovating and very innovatively sponsoring this week in startups. Uh, so let's see the video from Open Angel Forum. We'll just run the first minute or so of it. Any second now? Here we go. They made a little video. Oh, cool. Tonight was great. We had six great companies present. All of them were worthy of angel investment. In fact, most of them had raised some money already and were looking to finish their rounds. Uh, they presented for seven minutes, they took questions for seven minutes, it went very uh, efficiently and the feedback was that it was a well-paced event with a great crowd. We're not trying to replace other events like Open Coffee or the Tech Meetup. Those are great events for networking. This is a very, very micro event, uh, very strategic in nature, but the VCs and the angel investors enjoyed it and they said Really, they didn't want anything changed, with the exception of they would like to have the entrepreneurs in the room for the other entrepreneurs' presentations. The running joke with the Open Angel Forum is every entrepreneur has to take a sip of beer during the presentation. It's a much more laid-back, casual um, environment to present your company in. You know, we're being filtered and the angels are being filtered, and we're trying to create a higher percentage of matches. So instead of doing one-offs, Angels get to come out and hear five quality companies pitch, and at the same time, we get to hear, we get to present to 15 angels who are actually doing deal flow. So it's just a much more efficient process. Serving a dual role today, I am uh, an angel investor, and I'm also a presenter to raise angel money. You know, the venture community has obviously gone through a, a rough time in the last couple of years, and so you have to be frugal. You have to, you know, really stay focused on what you're trying to accomplish, and angels are a great bridge to get you to a place where you can actually do some more um, aggressive and larger financing. But we're actively raising money and we are uh, building a product, a really cool solar panel that's really efficient and really cheap. There is definitely a market need for a legitimate angel forum. Uh, the other forums out there were not really filled with angel investors mostly service providers or other entrepreneurs and people were paying to pitch to a room full of 100 people with maybe two or three impossible investors or somebody who had invested in 1999 or something it wasn't really too legitimate so um, we don't charge uh, the only people who pay are the service providers lawyers accountants uh, PR firms who can easily pay because startups and VC firms are their clients and they underwrite the event. I particularly enjoyed it because these are people who are serious, who recognize the business opportunity and who represent a major opportunity for me as someone seeking investment. This is also just one of numerous different channels that you know entrepreneurs have to try to get their companies funded in an early stage. So what we're trying to do here is just skim the cream. The top five percent of the startups so we had five people out of 100%, or six people out of 100% who applied, and then the top angel investors. So we probably turned away more angel investors or, you know, want to be angel investors than we actually had at the event. We only want to have 20 people max in the audience. We might raise some capital. We might raise an angel round and, you know, just get any one of the 15 angels that are here tonight on an involved in our company will definitely be a benefit. It's just not the capital, it's also the experience and the knowledge that the angels can bring, especially this select group of people. I would say, frankly, that this was the best opportunity that I have had so far to raise money for my company, by far. Of all the things I could possibly have done, and I've been venture back before, but for where we are and what we're doing, this, this was the event. Awesome, wow. Uh, Colorado TV for taking the time to film that little uh, vignette. Video is very powerful, and gosh, why didn't we think of that? We should have done that for LA. Any thoughts on the? I, uh, I think we did. We just wanted to keep it a little more uh, intimate. Int yeah, I guess so. <coughs> but he did a great job because he stood far back outside of the room, right? Shooting through the glass and everything, so it wasn't right. like intrusive. Uh, so, <laughs> what was your takeaway from Boulder, Tyler? Awesome tech stars program out there, and the community out there is really strong. There, so it has this very kind of teamwork. Uh, positive very energy, yeah. you know, very efficient because you can walk everywhere to from yeah, one company whole to the other. Yeah, startups. And they have so many events. It's like you made a pun during the tech 
meetup. It's like there's more events than startups out there. It did feel like that. Uh, and what a community and David Cohen uh, doing a great job there with Techstars. Yeah. And it's just the excitement level in Boulder is amazing. And uh, I was really happy. And it's almost as if you can see a vision starting to gel, I think. Mm -hmm. We, we saw a problem in the market, and really this is a good lesson for everybody who's a startup. You know, you see a problem in the market, it pisses you off, you think about it, you rap out about it, you come out with a better solution, and you test it in the market. We tested it in two cities. In both cities, we sold a number of tickets. I think we had $3,000 in revenue from service providers in LA and 6000 maybe in Boulder. So the two events made $9,000 total, and they cost three or $4,000 to do, so it's breaking even. It's not, not a money-making opportunity for me or anybody involved. But we proved the point that you can run one of these things efficiently at a high-quality level without uh, charging the startups. Mission accomplished. Uh, and I have a really great idea when we get to 10 cities. Um, I was just thinking about, because we have 10 cities, you realize, mm -hmm. quarterly. Yep. That would be 40 events. Yeah, it's one, like one a week. Five at each. Yeah is 200 companies. Yep. If we charge each of those companies 3,000 each, that's 600 grand we can make. Awesome. <laughs> this is really what entrepreneurship is about. No, <laughs> we're not going to charge the companies. But you can see how evil people, yep. that's what happens. They're just like, oh my god, wait a second. We've got this power. We can, we can go <laughs> screw with people. Uh, laughing in the background is my good friend Scott Morrow. Scott Morrow uh, is the CEO of Curate Media, formerly known only as This Next, now known as This Next, and also Style Hive. Hive, right. Yes. There's like five style companies. There's so there was, many. Oh, there's so everything, many. Everything, yeah. style this, style blender, <coughs> style fender. We bought the style good one. Yeah. You bought the good one, style <laughs> Hive. Um, I know this next very well because Gordon Gould, my good friend, uh, was the founder and I was on the board for a bit. And you guys had a great week this past week. We did. Raised some money we and did. made a big acquisition of Style Hive. How's, uh, how's it been? I see you got a ton of press for everything. We got great press. Um, and, you know, I think it's a reflection that social shopping is hot right now. You know, back in 2006, Hearst bought Caboodle. Yep. Uh, and if you'll recall, there were four original companies that kind of were leading social shopping. Caboodle, This Next, Style Hive, and Style Feeder. Right. So Hearst bought Caboodle back in 06, two weeks ago. Time bought Style Feeder. Hmm. Uh, again, a second validation in the market. And then we've consolidated the other remaining player, which is Style Hive. And there are a lot of smaller players. But in terms of companies of note and scale, we're now the largest uh, social shopping player that's remaining. And what does that exactly mean for, for somebody who has never heard the term social shopping? I mean, when you go shopping with your yeah. friends, is that social shopping or does this mean something else? Well, I have to tell a little bit of a story because it is a great anecdote. Um, Bob Tedeschi, uh, writer of the New York Times, right. he wrote a debut article back in 2006 on This Next. And he coined the phrase social shopping. So we actually birthed the category when we launched wow. This Next. And he said it's kind of social because there are social media tools and you can buy things, hence social shopping. Right. So uh, it's been an interesting kind of evolution that the right. market has just taken hold of that. And right. now it's a category. Yeah, it's a category. And, um, you know, we've kind of pioneered it. And right. I think we've evolved it. To your question, um, I think there is a misconception that you literally are with a friend on the site, tag teaming, looking for products and shopping. Right. That's not the concept. Right. Uh, it's social in the sense that we have social media tools that are integrated in our platform and we make it easy for people to discover products through your social graph or through a feed of brands uh, that we showcase on the site. And then in essence, you can shopcast or put out those picks that you find on your blog, on your um, MySpace page, on your Facebook, sure. you can Twitter about it. Um, it's just, it's social in nature. It's not that you're you right. know, arm in arm with someone. So users come on the site, they pick what products they like, yep. you friend a bunch of people like Facebook, and yep. all of a sudden you've got a stream of products Absolutely. coming from people who are like-minded. Exactly. Uh, and uh, it's been going well. And we'll talk about more, uh, more about the acquisition and what Curate Media means uh, going forward. Sure. But it's uh, time for a segment that most people consider their favorite part of the show. In fact, it could be its own show. It's uh, the segment known as Ask Jason. And that's a little graphic. And the phone is ringing. And when I answer the phone, I'm pressing the speaker button. OK. Uh, this caller is calling from 01145 which I know is the area code of Hoboken, New Jersey. Annabelle, nope. you're calling from Hoboken, 01145? Uh, no, I'm actually in Los Angeles. Oh, I thought you were from Denmark. Nope, Los Angeles. Oh, sorry. 
that would be Jason reading things wrong. Uh, this is, you're calling from the 323, which is Los Angeles. Yes. Our next call is from 01145. For those of you who want to Google what that is, it's not actually Hoboken. I was or you making can a bang joke. it. Or you can bang it. <laughs> Bada bang it. Uh, thank you, Tyler. That was yeah. a good one. Um, so, Denny. You are calling in to ask Jason, you've uh, been listening to the show for a while, or are you new to the show? Uh, I started listening uh, with Gary Vaynerchuk, and okay. I've been catching up ever since, currently on episode 14. Wow, working backwards to 14, you're, you're, you're in the kill zone. A, a, yes. a solid weekend this weekend, you could be down into the single digits. Uh, I suggest <laughs> you get your focus together and get into the single digits, and then you'll, you'll be... Uh, and I, I guess Gary V did bring a lot of people, introduce them to the show, so he was a great guest to have on. Um, Tell me, what is your question for Scott and myself? You have two amazing CEOs here and one, well, you have Tyler, who's got some wonderful <laughs> insights. Okay, so uh, let me give you a little Tyler's bit of Tyler's not a CEO, first. just for the record. He's a CEO advisor. Okay, uh, so um, I'm working on a service that allows uh, users to post requests for information and resources on consumer products, and then uh, other users of the site would come in and they uh, share that information or knowledge, whatever resources they have, and they post that to the original requester. Uh, the original idea was to keep everything free and focus on uh, community rewards, uh, such as like a point system. However, recently I've been thinking about allowing the user who requests information to also offer money as a reward to whatever user submits the best set of resources, uh, perhaps something similar to uh, how Mahalo dollars work. Yeah. Uh, so my question is, what is the good and the bad of bringing, uh, you know, reward money or just any kind of money in general to, like, a consumer-to-consumer -consumer service uh, yeah. like I have built? Yes. Oh, so this is a great question. Uh, Scott and I have had many debates about this over the years, uh, healthy debates. Yep. And what I would say is um, people, different people are motivated by different things. Uh, but there are some themes that run across almost all people universally. So let's talk about those universal themes. Uh, people like to do things that are fun. Fun is a driver. So people play Bejeweled. I don't know if you guys play Bejeweled. Sometimes you'll see on my Facebook page, I play Bejeweled 2 on, um, on my iPhone. It's ridiculously addicting. So whenever I've got a spare moment, sometimes I'm sitting there with the, my baby asleep on my shoulder, and I'm sitting there like I'm trapped. Because you know, when you, this is what happens when you have a kid. You put the kid down on your shoulder, they fall asleep. You're so paranoid about getting up. <laughs> you, you're basically like, I'm, I'm staying here. So then I just got my iPhone, I'm playing Bejeweled. Anyway. The fun of it makes it rewarding. However, there is also recognition in that you get badges and you get to reach different levels. There is also competition because you get to see how you do versus other players in Bejeweled 2, uh, which is a crazy game. Uh, and uh, so that's the recognition, affiliation, compensation. Uh, these are all different drivers. In Bejeweled, there is no compensation. But still, people are addicted to it. In Call of Duty, there's no compensation. People are addicted to it. However, in Ski Ball, uh, you ever play Ski Ball? Danny, yeah. when you were a kid? You get all those tickets, yeah. right? There's some things. Poker, there's lots of compensation if you win. Gambling, compensation if you win. Doing your job, compensation if you win. Uh, but money tends to be a low driver. Virtual currency is something new. Virtual currency combines part of the desire to get money. And money is a very weird driver for people. It's, it's very double-edged. People will do crazy things for money, as we've seen in today's news on Tech Meme. I'll get into it later during the news program. People will do crazy things for money, but people also will not make money their life's work in general. They, they'll they'll want to work at a job, maybe not for max money, but for max pleasure and enjoyment and fun and, and interest. But virtual currency taps into the competitiveness and the recognition and completion uh, drivers. That's why Zynga, Zanga, uh, Mark Pincus' company is crushing it. And that's why World of Warcraft is crushing because they're making money uh, by selling virtual currency. So virtual currency is a whole new category and it combines multiple drivers. You get the recognition, the accomplishment, uh, and you, might, you get some compensation in there. So I like having multiple drivers in a system. And this way, different people can be motivated by different ones like a leaderboard for competition and recognition, other people for cashing out their Mahalo dollars. There are people inside Mahalo who make you know, 100 Mahalo dollars, 200 Mahalo dollars a month and can cash them out. And instead they ask questions of high value because they, they prefer the joy of giving the money away. And that's another drive of people, altruism. altruism. 
Altruism? Altruism, yeah. Altruism. You yeah. said it. You got it. I said it. I got it right. <laughs> uh, so anyway, there's multiple drivers without knowing your exact thing. I suggest having a blended approach, Scott. This next uh, obviously has recognition and affiliation. It's a social network. Yeah, I you know um, would tend to agree with most of what you said. I, you know, at, at this next and now at Curate Media, um, we do crowdsource content. So UGC and Wisdom of the Crowds, uh, so to speak, is an important part of our business model. Um, we have not made um, economic reward a primary feature for creating community and you know drawing incentives around that. Um, rather, status, uh, recognition really are the two core components that we focus on when we build tools and features for our community. Now, I will say this, and it ties into what you were saying about virtual currency. If you can make your status, you know, credible and worth something, then it actually connotes value for the person who's getting that status. So for example, if I'm a community member and you bestow upon me the fact that I'm the number one recommender or tastemaker in New York for fashion, and you allow me, because you're credible, to put that distinction on my blog or any of my social media, right. that's worth something. Sure. I mean, it, you know, if I'm an independent consultant and I have a business on the side and it happens to be something around fashion and I have a third party who's credible in the marketplace saying, hey, you know, I have nothing vested in your gain, but I'm going to bestow upon you this distinction that you're number one in fashion in New York City, that's credible and that yeah. actually has value. So, so that it, giving of credibility is a form of recognition, I guess. Yeah. And you're you're anointing people, which Absolutely. is very powerful. Absolutely, and it's it it that uh, also um, uh, mixes up with affiliation. They're Absolutely. affiliated with other experts. Absolutely. So I knew for Weblogs Inc., just yep. being a blogger on Engadget for some people was more important than the check. They didn't care about getting ten bucks a post. They cared about being an Engadget blogger. They cared about going to CES. That was fun. Yeah. Right. That being said, money is a big driver, and sure. if used correctly, everybody's got to eat, right? Everybody needs to get a taste. People have bills to pay. It's good when you can blend them. When we did Weblogs Inc., people would criticize us for paying bloggers back in 2005, 2006. Oh my God, you're paying bloggers. You're going to ruin blogging. It had the opposite effect because we were paying people enough to live off of so that they could spend more time doing what they loved. So there is a balance. You don't want to create a system where people get so greedy that they forget about why they're there and it just draws the people who want to game yeah. the system. Uh, that's why on Mahalo, we make it $150 to cash out for real cash. Because we don't want people who are there to make a quick buck. Anybody who's there to game the system, we're going to find out they're gaming the system long before they hit that 150 cash out. We will let people cash out in future versions of Mahalo for like a, a beach towel or a mug for 10 Mahalo dollars or something. But then they're gaming to get, you know, swag, and it's not that big of a deal. Look at what happened with uh, real estate and the mortgage crisis. This was Wall Street at its worst, gaming the system for money and greed, and brokers doing the same thing, and even in some cases, uh, individuals living well above their means, gaming the system for monetary reward. So you got to be very careful. Does that help? Yes, absolutely. It's extremely valuable information. Okay. And uh, if you want really good examples of virtual currency, you obviously want to spend some time with Zynga uh, and World of Warcraft. Uh, and you, if you have a friend who is Korean, Ask them to show you SciWorld. Uh, and SciWorld, people spend a lot of money putting, buying coins to put music on their site, like you would pay for a ringtone. Uh, so micropayments, everybody thought that wasn't going to work. It hasn't essentially worked, but virtual currency has. So it's sort of like micropayments. If you type in, type in micropayments in and Bing, if you Bing micropayments, you probably find some interesting things. And look actually for virtual currency and then do a Bing video search because it's incredible. All right. Thank you for calling in, Denny. All right. Yes, thank you. When very you went much. to school, did people make fun of you like, oh, Denny, Denny's? Uh, yeah, a little bit here and there. <laughs> yeah. So did you call yourself Danny or something? Or did you think about changing your name to Danny or what? I mean, a lot of people, I've been called Danny, Vinny, Jenny. I mean, it's, it, there's, a whole, there's a whole slew of different exactly. things I've been called, but. I don't got to correct Denny like the restaurant. It's Denny like the restaurant. Oh, Denny's a uh, grand slam. Uh, <laughs> that, you think that's bad? I mean, I, you did have it bad. I could tell with the Denny's thing. Cause I, but anyway. He serves free breakfast on his birthday. So. Exactly. So <laughs> free breakfast to himself <laughs> on his birthday. Um, people would come up to me every Friday the 13th and say, oh, like Friday the 13th, like Jason Voorhees. And I go, oh, my God, you're so clever. How long did it take to think about the fact that it's, today is actually Friday the 13th and my name is actually Jason and the murderer in Friday the 13th is Jason. Tyler, what did they make fun of you for? 
They didn't make fun of Tyler because he's so damn cool. <laughs> yeah. I had it easy. He had it easy because yeah. he's cool, man. Everybody wanted to hang out with the cool kid. I yeah. take Tyler with me around the world. Everywhere we go, everybody just wants to hang out and talk to Tyler. All right. Thank you, Denny's. I mean, Denny. <laughs> I got gotcha. you. Cheers, mate. All right. Okay. That, was, that went pretty well. That was a grand slam of a question. That was a grand slam <laughs> of a question. Yes, it was. Route to Tutti Fresh and Fruity. Great advice, Scott. Oh, well done. Thanks. No. And uh, uh, you know what else is great? DNA Mail, DNA Mail. Everybody loves DNA Mail. Sponsoring the show since episode one. They've done 39 shows in a row. And if you're going to host uh, an exchange server uh, and get an IT guy to work at your company, you're a donkey. It's a stupid thing to do. You should outsource that, just like you outsource your legal or your accounting work and all these other things that are not core to a startup's business. And DNA Mail provides fully hosted, managed Microsoft Exchange and Google Apps. They partner with Google, huh? Pretty good. And it's much more economical. You pay per user. There's no other cost. It's 99.9999 percent uptime, or whatever they say uh, when they do all those nines. And uh, yeah, go ahead. Try to host your own email servers. You're going to be the cost of like upgrading the drives and dealing with when they crash and all your emails down and everybody's complaining and work stops. Forget it. DNA Mail. Everybody loves DNA Mail. I'm practicing my reads. Wow, that's pretty good. I love doing the that live commercial reads. That was good. It's so much fun. <laughs> uh, okay, now for the next part of uh, the sh show is Jason's Shark Tank. One more time. Boom! 540 people are watching live, and uh, even though Mark Burnett didn't uh, select me to be on Shark Tank, the other big uh, reality TV show emailed again this week. They got treatments, and we're, we're going into, uh, I guess we're going to have meetings. Meetings. You're going to be pitching the pitch show. Pitching the pitch <laughs> show. Pitching. All right, here we go. Nobody blog about that. It's probably not going to happen. Every couple of months, somebody says, oh, you should be on TV, to reality TV. I said, why would I need TV? I'm doing Ustream. I'm 500 people watching live, 25,000 people downloading it. Why would I deal with you not knuckleheads in TV business? Uh, they're not going to get it right. But maybe they will. Who knows? Uh, OK, you're calling from 01145, correct? Uh, yes, Denmark. Denmark. You are, yep. you are a This Week in Startups fan from Denmark. Yes. 11 o'clock around here. Uh, big fan since uh, Gary V, maybe. Oh, good. Around that time. Uh, one month later or something, I decided to quit and start my startup. Really? Oh, wow. So you took the prescription, and 30 days yep. later, you came out of your sickness of working for other people and started your own company. Yes. And now. Way more excited. It's basically like the Matrix. Once you realize that it's just the Matrix and you get out of your, like, that gelatinous gel and you rip it out, you say, I don't want to be part of the machine. Uh, yeah. Now you can fight against the machine. Okay, calling from Dem, are you from Copenhagen? Uh, yeah, Copenhagen. What's that restaurant in Copenhagen, the famous one with the open sandwiches on the brown bread? Oh, I don't know. It's there are it's, so it's many. A, it's a woman's name. Like, it's a woman's name. Why don't you look that up? Marta. Marta something? It's a family restaurant. Family restaurant that's yeah. been open forever. It's, it's right the in the center of, of Copenhagen. Of mother, but yeah. you get those brown bread sandwiches with the locks on top. Schmorberg. Is it Schmorberg? Is that uh, Yeah, you have to get I'm actually Portuguese. Oh, okay. And I'm here for so Okay. I don't know all. Wow. Well, all right, so you know how Shark Tank works. You have uh, 60 seconds to pitch us your idea. And uh, I'm going to ask everybody who is in the chat room to rate the idea on a scale of 1 to 10 for the pitch and a scale of 1 to 10 for the idea. So everybody in the chat room, get ready. Uh, and uh, Annabelle, are you ready? Yep. OK, three, two, go. OK, uh, influads.com. Is an advertising network built around influence. We aggregate different websites around the uh, topics of interest. Uh, for instance, startups, entrepreneurs, design, fashion. But Influx is also um, for advertising what minimalism is for architecture. We try to clear the web out of the bad advertisement. And uh, we do this by having one very simple but premium ad per page. 
we carefully select our publishers and advertisers, so uh, they are. Uh, so their unique um, value re is reflected into the end user. This gives users uh, a very clear value proposition, so they want to click the ads, and they offer a very clean and clutter-free web experience, because the website is out of ads, basically. Um, advertisers win through influence, contextualization, and visual, visual relevancy, since there is no noise fighting for their attention. There are a lot of other details, uh, like uh, endorsing uh, uh, advertisers and not endorsing their competitors, but basically this is uh, influet.com. Okay, uh, well done. Um, I think I understood the presentation, and I'm assuming influeds is I-N-F-L-U-A-D-S.com? Uh, yes. Okay. F-L-U. Yeah. Right, and Venture Hacks is one of your clients. Uh, yes, that's w one of the most known ones on uh, startups and entrepreneurs. Actually, Great. so um, what I interpreted from what you said is similar to the uh, Dig ad model, where people vote up the ads. You only serve one ad. It's the most popular ad, and it's some huge ad or something like that. It's the only ad on the page. You have 100% share of voice. But I'm on the uh, Venture Hack site, and I don't actually see the ad. So I don't know what the ad looks like, so I'm having a hard time um, uh, figuring that part out. But I do like the idea of maybe only doing really good ads and voting them up. It's just a little bit hard because sometimes the people who need advertising are the people who maybe um, are not as well known, so maybe they wouldn't get as many votes. Uh, but I, I think your pitch was clear, so I would give it a seven. And I've heard the idea before and seen it in various points, so I think that's also like a six or a seven. Uh, I'm looking in the chat room, I see people saying six and seven, six and eight, three and seven, uh, four eyes glazing over, three and three, too much inf uh, So anyway, you got, you got a range of uh, six and eight, six and 7.5, so you're, I would say that you're in the good range. Uh, what does this, a oh, yeah, Scott, Scott, what did you think of the pitch and the idea? You know, I, I think the idea actually has merit. I sure. think vertical ad networks actually still have legs. You know, yep. trying to create a horizontal one, forget about it. I think yep. there's, there are too many in the world already. Right. But vertical ad networks, I think, actually uh, is an interesting idea. I didn't like the pitch, personally, because, frankly, I didn't hear the story. Right. I didn't hear him tell a compelling reason about, here's the problem. Right. Here's what I'm addressing. Here's sure. my focus, and this is why it matters. Right. I didn't. I didn't get that. Right. So it felt like a laundry list of like I'm going to do this, this, and this, and it wasn't compelling from a story perspective. I think that's a good feedback. And so you would rate the pitch. Uh, a pitch of four. The idea is seven. Okay. So uh, if you had to choose, you would rather uh, have a lower pitch and a better idea because you can always make your pitch better. Uh, I th tell tell me. I have a question. Uh, follow up question. What does the ad look like? Is it a leaderboard or is it is it a, a medium rectangle? I, I don't understand that piece. The ad is actually in the front page, but very uh, badly placed and uh, with a color that kind of confused gets confused with the background. If you see on the top right, you will see there is a small ad there. So that's an area for improvement. Uh, the ad is not visible enough on the website. Which website? Venture Hacks? Uh, oh no, uh, Venture Hacks. Uh, the the community is launching only uh, only February 15, so okay. you have to wait. To you see on VentureX. If you go to infoex.com, you will see on the top right corner one small ad, and that's basically the ad, the ad uh, 125 by 90 pixels and 60 characters of text. Strange. I'm on your side. I don't see it. Um, but I do see that you have some. Hmm. Pull out my screen for a second. Huh. I don't see it on the site. Where is the ad? Uh, okay. Well, uh, and how do you select the ads again? Uh, the community is uh, very carefully curated. We, we, we carefully select publishers and advertisers to make sure we build a, a very solid community around one specific topic. Uh, we don't want advertisers that won't, uh, won't give any value to the, to the users. So we are really, really keen into getting relevant people on board. Oh, I see. So the ad, the ad on your site is got your logo in it. 
And it says yeah. simple but meaningful in context and reach. So that little ad there is the ad, uh, and it's one of those little box ads. Okay, so just a little tip here. If it's an ad, it's got to look like an ad. So I would put something in there that looks like an ad, yeah. you know, with an arrow on it that says, like, this is an ad, and here's how it will look, and here are some sample ads. The first thing I want to see on the site is what are the sample ads? Uh, and so you're telling me that little tiny ad is the only ad that's going to be on the page? Uh, each website will have, will have only one ad okay. like that. So that's not, that's not going to work. It's not going to no. monetize. No. You're going to need a big ad that goes from left to right. That's like a marquee if you're only going to have one. And you should say this is, you should somehow make it clear, this advertiser was selected by our customers. Please, you know, patronize them. Boom. And I think operationally making sure you have a standard IEB ad unit for efficiency reasons. Sure. You have people who are going to like place ads on your site. Totally. They don't want to do custom creative. You need to be standard ad unit sizes. Okay. Yeah, it's not aggressive enough. It's too small, especially if you can have one. And, you know, the problem is really going to be most small sites have a hard time getting one advertiser, two advertisers. Now you're saying there has to be a market of them to get voted up and down. And so that's going to be hard um, because you're going to be turning away money. And most people can't, don't have enough money. So, you know, if you, if this was in Gadget and was sold out for the year, you could, you could maybe do that. And in fact, I think that's how. I think either Vanity Fair or Rolling Stone worked that way. They used to, or maybe it was um, Cigar Aficionado. The, the head of, the publisher of Cigar Aficionado, I think, used to pick who got the back cover based on how beautiful their ads were. Oh, wow. So, like, you could say, like, I would like to have the back cover, and then he'd look through the ads and <laughs> say, okay, you got it, and then they'd charge you a little extra for the back cover from whatever spot you're in. Anyway, you did a good job. You got a lot more work to do, and uh, everybody can follow you. Are you on Twitter at InfluAds? Oh, uh, yeah. Okay, so everybody will follow you and uh, keep a surprise. Scott Simcoe, super fan Scott Simcoe, who is now blogger Scott Simcoe, will be following up with you in 30 days and seeing how you're doing. Uh, hopefully, you can uh, uh, keep iterating and make it better. Yes. Well Thanks done. Thanks a lot for the feedback. Cheers. And, uh, my Twitter is very welcome. Okay. Good luck and uh, get some sleep. <laughs> Thanks. Bye. It's freezing in Denmark. Um, the Danes. The Danes. I, <laughs> I have a hard time with ad networks because, yeah. you know, there's a lot of great innovative ideas, but, you know, you ha it has to work for the advertiser. I don't know how yeah. this exactly works for the advertiser. Yeah. I understand why it works for the users. Users want to see better ads. Um, but... Uh, well, I'm not sure it works for the publisher. you got to pick one. Either work for the publisher or right. work for the advertiser. I mean, the only thing that Google AdSense does work for the yeah. publisher, the yeah. advertiser, yeah. and the... Yeah. Consumer. Because of liquidity, though. They have enough volume. They have and critical mass. Yes. And scale matters. His idea, scale matters, and yeah. he doesn't have it. Uh, even uh, if you look at Dig, which is yeah. a very significant site with 40 or 50 million uniques, yeah. I'm not sure exactly yeah. how many they have, maybe 40 yeah. or 50 million uniques. And they even are having a hard time, but yeah. they're doing something very innovative with you You dig the sure. ads. Yeah. And, uh, you know, if they get a lot of digs, they get charged less money, which I think is yeah. pretty compelling. So that they get good. to show more ads. That is good. So the more digs it gets, the lower the price gets. I mean, it's great that people are trying to crowdsource this, but ads are meant to be a little disruptive. So it's nice to innovate, but hmm, who knows. Now, we got an interesting package in the mail. And I should probably show it, but let's see here. This is a pretty crazy... We get a lot of crazy super fans on the show, Scott. Okay. And the super fans... <laughs> um, like to, they're very creative. The super fans. Should I stand back? <laughs> no, it's not a bomb. I always, yeah. When, I, when these kind of boxes come into the office, I'm like, hmm, this could be dangerous. Tyler, you open it. Uh, well, that's and cool. so they, somebody made T-shirts, but not one, but a number of them. And you might recognize some of these. This T-shirt says, well, it's kind of hard to see because it says, but it actually says, like sneakers at a funeral. Oh my God. Which some of you might remember is an insight by Tyler. Like sneakers at a funeral, pretty nice. And I wonder if you put on Scott's camera for a second. Maybe I can hold that up like that and you'll see it. Can we try uh, the guest camera? Yeah, there you go. Look at that. I can actually. So there you go. That's like sneakers at a funeral. <laughs> pretty funny. And they actually have uh, sneakers on a coffin. Pretty good, huh, Tyler? Yep. Then, uh, if people are like, oh my God, it's, that's so awesome. It gets better. That is but one t-shirt. Uh, this one. Everybody remembers as a great insight by Tyler, which is, it's like betting against the Mayans. Which, if you don't know why you shouldn't bet against the Mayans, you shouldn't be betting. And you can see there's a Mayan temple on the Ace of Spades. 
like betting against the mines. People are going crazy in the chat room. Uh, then, another great t-shirt. It's like Japanese jazz. Another great insight by Tyler. And the final one, everybody's favorite, probably the one that started it all. Was that the one that started yeah, it all? Yeah, it is the first one. And the one that started it all, of course, like a wheelchair at Disney. And you can see the person in the wheelchair is obviously Mickey Mouse if he was handicapped. So like a wheelchair at Disney, some insane fan went crazy and made these shirts. Now, we, we got four of these shirts, but are they available for sale on the site? I, he didn't say. He didn't say. He but just sent them. He did leave his phone number. He left his phone number. Let's, do, let's try doing a little live call. This is the first time we've ever done it. We're going to call the guy who made these crazy shirts, and we'll see if we can buy them. I'm trying to do that so people don't memorize the phone number from the sounds. Uh, yeah. <laughs> there we go. Shh, everybody, shh. Ringing. Shh. Is that his name on there? Shh, shh. Shh, shh, shh. This is Charles. I'm sorry I missed your call, but the best way to reach me is to text me. Thanks. Hi, Charles. It's Jimmy Wells. Um, I noticed your website, and I was really interested in talking to you about how we might work together. My phone number is 310-456-4900. Again, it's Jimmy Wells of Wikia. Talk to you soon. <laughs> this is pretty funny, huh? <laughs> so you're like, what is Jimmy Wells calling me for? <laughs> um, we'll see if he So uh, somebody text him, somebody who has the number. Uh, and text him and tell him, well, I, how do we do that? <laughs> ah, whatever. Anyway, thank you to him for making these crazy shirts. And the guy is from uh, uh, Shirty App. Shirty App. S H I R T E E A P P dot com. And we're trying to figure out what this is. But Shirty App, I have it pulled up on my screen here, is you can make a t shirt with your iPhone. And so we think that this person made the shirt. We think the person is from this company. Is that right? Right. And that's a really good idea. Yeah. To make a t-shirt from your iPhone. Bizarre, but good. <laughs> uh, okay, so that's that. Um, Hopefully we'll have those available somewhere at some point for, yeah. Give the air conditioner. Yeah. Okay. Um, hopefully they'll be for sale at some point. Yeah. Um, Voicemail uh, got a five for the performance <laughs> and an eight for the eye. I don't know what the eye is for, for the idea. Okay, very good. <laughs> People are rating the voicemail now. Um, WebSpy, WebSpy, thank you to WebSpy for sponsoring the show. Another uh, sponsor for all 39 episodes, I believe. They monitor all kinds of activity from employee internet access to mail servers to web hosts, analyze for traffic levels, pattern errors, and more, a total log analysis solution. And uh, you can pick all this stuff uh, and see whatever you want and what's going on in your network. And that keeps you from having problems. Like, you don't want to, like, have a problem with an employee doing something illegal on your network. Uh, we've all seen what can happen when people have employees doing bad things on their network. You don't want to have to monitor everybody looking over the shoulder. So maybe you want to know what's going on. And somebody's got BitTorrent traffic going on. Maybe they shouldn't, et cetera. They're not, they're not there to block anything. They're not into censorship. They just want to give you an education as to what's going on in your network so you can avoid problems in the future. Uh, this is very important to do. And if you're a fan of the show, you should always thank the sponsors uh, by saying thank you at Bing, at Ustream, at WebSpy, at DNA Mail, and at PowerVPS, who we'll talk about during the news. Uh, Scott, thanks for being on the program. We've been waiting for a long time yes. to have you on. Oh, thank you. And uh, I knew you guys were doing this deal yes. uh, for a while. And I said, hey, why don't you wait until the deal closes? Because then you have a lot to talk about. Absolutely. Uh, so tell us, why did you guys do this deal? I mean, you two different companies that were competing. And then how do you see them coming together? Is it, sure. Are you going to make one site out of the two of them? Are they going to yep. remain two communities? Yep. Why did you do the deal? And what's, what's next? So as you know, we've been in social shopping, kind of pioneered the category since 06. And one of the things we've found is that community tends to aggregate 
around a distinct passion topic or vertical. So let's take fashion, for example. Um, the people who are into fashion are really into fashion. And they may or may not be into other categories like home and garden or sports and outdoors. And, you know, frankly, from a consumer standpoint, what we felt was we would be better off serving those community members who are passionate about social shopping through vertical properties versus a singular umbrella brand that tried to be all things to all people. And acquiring StyleHive was opportunistic because it allowed us to set in place, frankly, our strategic roadmap of going after social shopping in a vertical way. So we created, um, with the acquisition, a new corporate brand, which is Curate Media. And I'll give you a, a little bit of explanation around why Curate Media in a second. But the plan is that we will have StyleHive be our mainstream um, social shopping property in fashion, beauty, and style. It will keep its brand, it'll keep its site, it'll serve that community. Mm -hmm. And this next will actually be slightly repositioned back to its original core in the DNA in, in, in which it launched, which is design products. So those interesting, unique, specialized products, that boutique-like shopping experience, that is what this next will actually serve. And then we have additional categories that we plan to launch either organically, and frankly, we're also looking to acquire more companies in 2010. Uh, so categories like sports and outdoors, um, tech and gadgets, um, eco green, parenting kids. Um, we have an ambitious plan to create a portfolio of vertically driven social shopping properties which serve those communities that, that form around that. Awesome. Yeah. And so I'm looking at this next right yep. now. Yep. And so we talked about social shopping before. Right. Real people making real picks and then you yep. try to surface them. Sure. And it's amazing. You do actually find really neat things. So it's yep. like a dig type experience, except yep. you don't see the number of votes. Uh, but people are surfacing yep. the most interesting products. And I've bought products from here a number of times. Sure. And I'm like, how come I can't find those products anywhere? And but what, what is it that makes this work? Is it this a cool hunters out there or something? Yeah, you know, we, you know, at the core of our business model is crowdsourcing. So we rely on the community and the passionate people who are avid shoppers in that particular vertical to go out and scour the web and bring back to the community the best products. And again, they do that because of status and recognition. Right. And frankly, they're just fanatical about that particular vertical. So that crowdsourcing creates a pool of products. And then we use collaborative filters. We use algorithms. And, and, and you know, frankly, internally, we select, and it's our form of editorial, which is curation. We curate that content up from the crowdsource content, which in essence programs the particular site and vertical. So that's why we've launched the name Curate Media. Is it actually applies to our business model? Right. Crowdsource content in distinct verticals, and then curate it through algorithms or through editorial. Right. Which is what my next question would be: is you know controlling spam and stuff like yep. this. So if you look here. This candle thing is very cool. It's like yep. a candle holder that I guess when you burn the wax, it, it goes into this bottle and you just have like this huge ball of wax. It's kind of yep. crazy. And it's recommended by just Ella, just Alina's. And I can go click on her yep. to see what else she's done. Uh, excuse the slow connection here. We only have a 20 megabit connection on an sure. Apple MacBook that has six, 60 kilobits of RAM, I think. Uh, mm -hmm. <laughs> it takes forever. We have to get this out of here. Um, Anyway, you get to see what else she's recommended, and she's got her profile here with other kind of interesting things like these sneakers and a metal sign and yep. uh, a thumb piano. Yep. Uh, and you can see her influence. Yep. She's in the top 0.4%. Yep. Uh, with 8,000 picks. With 8,000 <laughs> picks. So she, this is a pretty serious person, but she's yep. number one in Atlanta, yep. number six in Brooklyn, et cetera. Yep. So she's a power user, and you can see she's got her friends here. So yep. I could look at this person, Joyce White, who's blowing yep. a kiss to the camera. Yep. <coughs> and you start to find all these people who are, I guess, passionate about products uh, and picking them. Yeah, and, and the fundamental value prop we're offer, offering, again, to consumers is what should I buy? You know, and <coughs> unlike comparison shopping, which is really fulfilling demand that's already there and it's more transactional in, in nature, we're further up the marketing funnel in helping people discover products. So discovery is a huge part of the UI. It's a huge part of the algorithms that we create. Um, and you know, frankly, when you come to this next, I'd be surprised if you didn't find something that you didn't know existed. And, and that it, you'd be interested in, frankly. Yeah, it, it, so it's, uh, it's, it's really that fun, <coughs> entertaining, quite you know, social shopping experience that we really focus on. So how do you control spam in something like this? Because I'm looking at it going, my god, there's all these interesting people putting stuff up here, yep. but isn't somebody going to start putting affiliate links in here and just start spamming it like crazy with sure. their idiotic stuff? Yep. How, how do you how do you make sure that? Let, look at this one. This is a groovy one. 
Rubik's Cube salt and pepper grinders. Yeah, I mean, that's, I mean, mm. where would you where ever would you see that? Where would you ever see that? It's almost like, I mean, this is like, if I have to buy Tyler a birthday present, I'm going to this site because I, I've never seen Tyler so happy as when he saw the salt and pepper thing. Yeah. You must love this next. Yeah. <laughs> you browse through it and it's interesting. You can, look, it's, people are talking about this, how great this is. Interesting. But, you know, so how do you control space? Well, you have to moderate yeah. crowdsource content. I mean, yeah. frankly, un, you know, filtered UGC is, is not tremendously valuable to the consumer, in my opinion. Right. I think you have to have some moderation, and that either has to come internally through people right. you staff right. who look at the content, you know, are monitoring for spam, monitoring for improper behavior that's not in line with our values of our brand. But we also rely on the real, you know, trendsetters and what we call the mavens. These are people that we bestow almost an editorial distinction because of their influence, because of their activity, and frankly because of their good standing in the community. They, in fact, do a better job than we do internally because they're so active of right. policing the content. And they're always raising to us, hey, look at so-and-so, this is not right, and they'll flag it, and then we'll evaluate it, and then we'll reach out to the person and say, this is not in line with our values. And Style Hive, yep. a slightly, so basically to recap in terms of spam, yep. Yep. you you look for spam and you get rid of it. And Absolutely. the community looks for it and gets rid of it. And we're not 100%. Right. I mean, you know. And if you go crazy, yep. you turn it to 4chan. Absolutely. And so it's yep. pretty yep. pretty obvious what happens if you don't. Right. Here, Style Hive, right. and what's popular on Style Hive this month, uh, which seems to revolve around lingerie and underwear and bras, uh, not complaining um, <laughs> or anything. I'm just making an observation. Well, yeah, and it's a community uh, as well. I mean, they, yeah. crowd, they crowdsource and they have a more of a bookmarking. It's more of a technical explanation. Right. We're not technically a bookmarking service at this next. StyleHive actually is in the way that they bring content back because each item is an individual SKU, an individual link Got on it. the site. We consolidate that into one item on this next. It's a more of a technical back a technical end. thing. Yeah, but, but, but they do explicitly show how many times it's been saved. So they take the delicious metaphor yep. and then they they list that, so it's sort of like votes, like dig. Yep. You guys don't show votes. No. What is the uh, thinking behind, because now you have two brands, one showing votes, one sure. not showing votes. Yeah. What is the thinking uh, yeah. which works better? And why? I, I don't. I don't think it's a matter of one works better than the other. Um, I, you know, frankly, one of the things we liked that they had and did a better job and showed proficiency around was creating editorial. You'll see that there's actually a pretty active blog component to the service and the programming. And frankly, on this next, we had relied almost entirely for the last three years on crowdsource content that we filtered, of course, and moderated. But we felt that we could actually enhance the value that we provide to users around product discovery by putting more of an editorial veneer on top of the crowdsource content. So they've done a good job of that, and we certainly want to borrow that in terms of enhancing our service. Um, and, you know, frankly, I think it's the combination. Um, you know, I had a lot of debates with a lot of people who run community, and there's so many, um, <laughs> you know, frankly, dogmatic uh, philosophies about, oh, if you crowdsource content, it's the only form of content you can have. I, I don't believe that. I believe crowdsource content can coexist with editorial. I think it can coexist with brand content if labeled and marked accurately. And I think it can uh, coexist with other forms of uh, paid content. Yep. And, you know, frankly, as long as it's delineated and as long as it's focused around product discovery and helping the consumer get to those great products, to me, it's Mission actually a win-win. Yeah. So uh, I don't really, you know, view it as they're better, this is worse. I think yeah. all content is either it's helpful. <laughs> done well or not. Right? Yeah. So I guess if the mission is to find interesting things, both sites do yep. that. They Absolutely. do it slightly differently. Yep. Uh, here's one thing that StyleHive that has that's pretty interesting, which is a leaderboard yep. of the top users. Top user with 24,000 people, yep. 6,900 people on BusyBee, 12,000 following this person, 11,000. And then I see something interesting. Saks Fifth Avenue yep. has a user account, yep. as does Levi Jessica, um, yep. assuming that those two people are the actual, are actually from the brands. Absolutely. And that's one of the things they do a much better job than we have at this next. But we frankly want to borrow that and leverage that into yeah. our platform. Because again, if you're passionate about a particular vertical, Getting brand qualified, uh, brand content that's delineated, qualified ahead of time, I think is a, a value to the user. Yeah. Um, so they do a great job of it, and, and uh, we, you know, we're going to definitely leverage. It that. seems like the, what what Style Hive has done particularly well yep. is get this uh, sort of social media following sure. each other thing yep. going really well. Yep. But when I look at the top level of it and I try to browse it, sure. 
not as great of a browse experience as nope. this next. No. Nope. So yep. now as a CEO of two sure. companies with two different skill sets. Sure. One is doing a great job on community, crushing it, but not very browsable, looks sure. a little too busy to me. Yep. The other one looks gorgeous, sure. but maybe not as much community activity. Yep. How are you going to take those two things and take the two disciplines and make them uh, cross-pollinate? Sure. Mu you, it must be incredibly hard because one is built on another platform in another city, yep. and, and yep. you're going to go to a common platform. And how do yep. you keep the company moving forward yep. with all of that overhead of, oh my God, these people are on Linux and these people are on... You know, is yeah. one written in PHP and another one Python? Yeah, there's Java over yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So, I mean, you got a lot of work. How long is it? <laughs> right. So, I just asked you 17 questions. <laughs> How long is it going to take? Are you looking forward to this, or is yeah. this just going to be a, a brutal six yeah. months of integration? Yeah, well, acquisitions are hard. So, mm -hmm. you know, if you look at the history of any company who's done acquisitions, there are tremendous operating challenges that are inherent in doing them. Um, one of the things, though, that we liked about StyleHub, and frankly, it mitigates some of the risks that you, you know, appropriately mentioned, is that the core and the DNA, if you really get down to the value prop, which, you know, there are different ways to cosmetically present a solution around a value prop, but if you get down to the value prop of product discovery, both sides do that. Now, for the time being, and when I say the time being, I mean pretty much for the remainder of this year, we're going to continue to operate StyleHub pretty much as it is because they're serving a community pretty well today. Yeah. Uh, and this next, we actually do have a pretty uh, exciting uh, site redesign uh, that we're launching uh, probably in the spring. Mm -hmm. uh, we've seen got some mocks. We've started some development of it. It's, it's really, really cool stuff. And it does get back to you know, how it's being positioned within Curate Media. Um, so our focus will be on that property. Um, StyleHive, uh, it, you know, frankly, its traffic has continued to grow. Uh, the community seems really engaged. Uh, we're not planning to do much with that site in 2010 uh, because we also want to add additional properties. So if it wasn't challenging enough so to try to integrate. So which platform then are you going to do it on? Is it going to be the StyleHive platform or this next platform? Or do you take the two teams and say, let's yeah. make a third platform to unite them all? It's the latter, yeah. So we oh actually. Oh, my God. Yeah, so that is well, a lot of work. Well, but the, the latter is actually oriented around search. So. Uh, you know, if you think about your good friends at Bing, uh, yeah. and also uh, the other search service that's out there, uh, you know, having Yahoo. yes, yes. <laughs> I think you're talking about ask.com. No, of course, Google. Right. Um, you know, frankly, we get a lot of our traffic, as do most publishers, sure. from search engines, right. and we don't think that's a bad thing. No, uh, we think it's a great thing, and sure. it's validation that our content. Uh, is credible, uh, that it has a lot of referring links, that we do a good job of refining search terms, and that then it's frankly updated. monetizing it. Yeah. So, you know, we're developing uh, a next generation platform that actually works across both properties ah. uh, that allows us to take content of all forms to actually put into that engine that Got actually it. drives search efficiently where we compete well and most importantly where we can monetize it. Got it. So is that like is it like.com is the one that's in the market that yeah. people are doing searching for products on? Yeah, so like is um, what I would call second generation comparison shopping uh, in that a they almost exclusively rely on algorithms uh, to yep. create product discovery. Uh, they do a fantastic job of by the way. Uh, it's a very well uh, run company. Um, but they also and this is a difference is they exclusively rely on SEM and paid traffic for their oh. distribution. So they're so focused they're on RPV. Yeah, they're, that not, stuff. they're not trying to really create community. There's no crowdsourced content. There's no consumer direct experience. Um, so it's really say, arbitrage in second generation form. So just to define for the audience, what is arbitrage? What is SEM? Yeah. Explain what you mean. Yeah, so they're, you know, as with any internet business, there are a few things you have to get right. <laughs> One of them is distribution. Um, and for most comparison shopping businesses, and historically the original ones were Shopping.com, Price Grabber, Shopzilla, Nextag, etc., they essentially used arbitrage and paid search to create their distribution. What, what do I mean by that? Yes. Essentially, you know, Google AdWords, um, Yahoo has a similar paid search service where you can bid on specific keywords that you want to rank highly in the paid search results for to drive traffic to your site. So it becomes a game of arbitrage because what you bid on that keyword to drive traffic from the search service into your property, you obviously have to make more money <laughs> than what you've bid on in order to create margin. So these companies become maniacally focused on revenue per visit mm. and click-through rate. It's almost the only metrics that matter. Right. They, don't, they don't care about direct audience, they don't care about engagement, they care about how efficiently can I get you into my service and get right. you out in margin. So, okay. so that's here, the arbitrage. I just typed in a search for men's blue shirt. Yeah. 
In where? Where did you type it in? Uh, I, I did Google this time. Okay. Uh, and only because I wanted to see they have more ads on yep. Google. I mean, Bing is much more clean yep. experience with less ads. Uh, <laughs> joking. Uh, but as you see here, when I type that in, the last ad, yeah. Blue Men Shirts, is yeah. from Like.com. Yeah. I click on that, and I go to a page, and this is what arbitrage is for people who yep. don't know, yep. and paid searches. They send people to a page that yep. is optimized to make money. Absolutely. So they just pay $0.10 cents for that link, for that click. They get a thousand clicks that would cost them. By the way, they probably paid thirty to forty cents. Like, okay. just I mean, it's it's shopping expensive. It's very expensive. So let's yeah. say they paid thirty cents yep. per click. Yep. That means if they had a thousand clicks, that cost three hundred dollars. Yeah. Yep. So they paid three hundred dollars to send a thousand people to this page. Yep. And on this page, if you look at the page that they sent me to the landing, are a bunch of blue shirts from different people, and they're yep. getting paid probably on conversion or on a sale or on a click. Um, likes getting paid on uh, click. Basis. Uh, uh -huh. There are models that are CPA in nature, so um, it depends. In, so in, if they're getting paid they, on they, click yeah. here, yeah. they have a direct relationship with all these different providers to um, get it, paid per click. You think? You know, I don't know the nuance of sure. their operations, but it could be that they have developed individual relationships with brands. Most likely, they've done an aggregated relationship. Sure. For example, Shopping.com has white labeled as as Price Grabber and Shopzilla a component of their business to allow publishers or ah. distribution points to cut one relationship and they have in turn cut many to the individual retail. So if they get paid 40 cents per uh, 20 cents a click you here. You just made 10, 10 cent margin. It, if they get paid 40 but and then it, why wouldn't that person just buy blue the keyword blue shirts themselves? That's what I understand. Which person? The, um, the, the Zappos or because I saw Zappos and Liss or, or Cattenberry or whoever yeah, these people are selling it's, shirts. Um, you know the engineering and the um, um, you know frankly the technology and the platform uh, I see. involved to do paid search at scale. First of all, I'm sure they are. Right. <laughs> so Zappos, any retailer is sure. doing some form of paid search, either in-house or most likely through Because I see Nordstrom and LLB yeah, of and course. Lanzan and J. Crew above them. So yeah. basically, they're competing with them. Absolutely. For to sell their own shirts. Yeah. Like you know, if you you know operationally, I know you know like for example, I think they have at the time 50 employees, 45 are engineers. Like it's a very engineering intensive business. So, to so basically, do. their site has no community, but they just do all the SEM. Yeah. You guys are all community, and you get SEO. Yeah. So two we'll different types of business. Let's we'll do, do an example by comparison. If you're in Google and you type in funny clock. Clock or clock? Yeah, clock. C-L-O-C-K. Ah, funny clock. Yeah, or you could do cute summer dress, either one, but funny clock. So Best funny you, clocks. Yeah. Boom, you're number two. We're number two. And this is a great experience. It's a mid to long tail search term, which sure. is where we tend at this next to These focus our funny. product. You look at that list. It's a great user experience if you're looking for funny clocks. Wow. You know, we've consolidated all of those products that meet that term. And that's a great example of how we're taking crowdsourced content, we're refining those results based on original search terms from all search engines, including Bing. And when the user comes to our site, we're creating a compelling and refined search experience. By the number of people who essentially voted for it, recommendations. Yeah. And of course, you get the whatever clock, yeah. <laughs> yeah, which right. has, this is, this is for the person who's given up in yeah, life. Yeah. The whatever <laughs> clock. <laughs> whatever. Tyler, I'm going to get you this for Christmas. That's great, isn't whatever. it? Whatever. Isn't that great? Yeah. I'll get that clock for Jimmy Wells. Yeah. Jimmy Fowles clock. Yeah. Whatever. Uh, and I think one of the distinctions I'd make is because we have community and we have crowdsourced content and we actually do care about the, the consumer in, in a you know engaged experience, we have more media DNA than a traditional comparison shopping company. And that's reflective of the revenue model. We have third of our revenue today come from traditional CPM brand advertisers looking to reach an audience in a you know standard IEB way or custom uh, ad integrations within our conversational media and then two-thirds of our revenue is coming from leads that we create on behalf of brands and retailers when we pass in the example of funny clock a consumer who did a search term came to our site refined their search visit on our site and then we pass it to the brand and retailer we get paid a lead fee for doing that cool and the sites right now, StyleHive and this next, both getting about a million people a month using it. You know, internally, um, we always use our internal logs. Yeah. You can look at other data as well. Sure. But 3.3 uh, million monthly uniques collectively. Um, you know, our business is seasonal, um, so that's as of today. Yeah. We will be higher certainly over the holiday sure. season, uh, and as we continue to grow organically. But uh, it's about evenly split between the two. So this is a new thing. People have to try to. Uh, People haven't, in a, in a large way, learned what yep. this is yet. I mean, yep. right now they're yep. doing searches to find stuff, Absolutely. like I yep. did, blue shirt, yep. or they go, you know, yep. to Amazon and sure. try to use the category yep. system and drill down. Yep. What you're saying is, instead of using search and a deliberate method, yep. just browse. Yeah. And it's curated. 
Yeah. Not unlike when you go to the mall Absolutely. and they, what they put in the front of the store yeah. is different than what's in the back of the store. Yeah. And there's so many use cases where that's appropriate. Let's say, in fact, someone who just had a baby like yourself. Yes. If I were to be a good citizen and a good friend, which I am remiss that I've not done that so far, you uh, and buy you a, a gift for your baby, where would I start? I don't, right. I don't have a child. So how would I search in Google for right. baby gift right. versus on a service like this next um, where you could actually discover cool baby gift products? I, it's amazing. I just typed in baby, and I really want to get this Jimi Hendrix yellow short sleeve onesie. Yeah. I mean, it, it like where would you ever find that in you know? No. How would you search for that in Google? Right, of course you wouldn't. not. Yeah, uh, and all these oh baby book with a wood cover. It's kind of cool. I'm gonna just like see. This is the thing about when you do a search on this next, you just sort of disappear into it for an hour because yeah. there's so many interesting things. One of the f my favorite features, and I know you've been a fan of it for a while, and I think um, you even talked about it with Twitter developing a, a, a knockoff on ours as well, is our world map of watching people uh, shop. Ah, yeah, that's great. It's, it's a, a great. It's under explore. Yeah, uh, it's under explore. It's it's um basically it's a voyeuristic way to observe real time. On our site, what people are shopping. It's the for. shopping stream. Yeah, and so it's here a it feed. is. I pulled it up, and you know this shows you know what around the seeing? world. And look at this. I mean, you know now we're in the UK. Someone's discovered a Dolce Gabbana corset. Now we're back in the US and LA. And again, this is real time on our site. This is a reflection of both the global scale of our business, plus it gives you insight into some of the cool, unique products. Down at the uh, footer, I don't know if you can see in the screen. I load, do. Um, it's thumbnails. loading the products that you've, in essence, discovered. Right. So it's creating a trail. Uh, and it, yeah. if at any point you want to dive deeper, you can click on one of those images and go to the, the item page and, and go, sure. go go buy it. That is pretty groovy. Uh, yeah, it's cool stuff. I'm waiting for something to come out from Kazakhstan, but I'm, I'm no, <laughs> no, no, this next user is yeah, from yeah. North Korea? Yeah. Not what? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <Where are the? laughs> yeah. <laughs> well done, well yeah, done. Yeah. Uh, and so um, you came in as the sort of professional CEO <laughs> to this next uh, after there was a startup founder. Sure. What's it like to come in after there's an original founder? What, what's the pros? What's the cons? Yeah. How do you come in and sort of take over well, a company when you have a passionate founder and you're coming in in some ways as like the suit or sure. like the professional manager sure. and all these different ways they describe professional CEOs. What's that like? Yeah, so there's one added wrinkle. I didn't come in as CEO. I came in as president. Ah. Um, and I think it made it even more challenging, frankly. Um, now, I was fortunate in that I was blessed with, you know, a, a very supportive board, um, yep. supportive of the company, supportive of me, sure. and frankly, more so, uh, a, you know, a really gracious, um, honorable uh, founder in Gordon, yep. who, you know, frankly, that's a tough transition for any uh, sure. uh, entrepreneur. Give up your baby. Yeah, and, you know, he was uh, incredible in that transition, uh, always supportive of me, and um, you know, I was lucky on that front. Now, the challenges are tremendous. Um, typically, professional managers, and I say professional, it's not like entrepreneurs aren't professional, right. but in terms of scaling businesses, you know, I have professional training in doing that right. and have done so at a lot of publicly traded companies. Uh, coming in, um, there was a different way of doing things because it was very entrepreneurial, as it right. should have been, very seed oriented. And, you know, Gordon had a very special skill set that was, or, you know, oriented around early stage. Right. Uh, and, um, you know, we we were transitioning from that, and so getting an operating rhythm with a founder who remains in the business, who still has the CEO title, but the board and also the business is looking for more professional management and to scale the company, it, it, it's going to naturally create conflicts. And, you know, we had them, uh, but again, yeah. I was lucky in that we worked through them. We worked through them with respect, and yeah. he and I are still very close friends. Yeah. I see him occasionally, and he's still a member of the board. So, but you know, it was <laughs> it was a tough, tough uh, year yeah, and a half. Yeah, it's always a tough yeah. transition when. Yeah, the, when and, the, and, you know, the other part is, and, you know, you've started a lot of companies as well and been tremendously successful. When you can pick your team from the ground, yes, that makes all the difference in the world. Right. I inherited everything. I inherited a board. Right. I inherited investors. Right. I inherited a CEO right. that I had to supplant. So then you've got to go create your so, own culture. Yeah. With soldiers yep. that yep. you didn't hire for your army. Yep, exactly. Mm -hmm. And you don't have time to pull the car over, change the wheels, stop momentum, right. and tell the board, let's hold off on metrics yeah. and growth while I go. Yeah, let's take a pause. Let's, let's reboot. You can't do that. You can't really and, do that. Um, and, you know, I, I think a uh, lot of good lessons. It was tough. And, um, you know, I think we've, you know, frankly, it's taken two years to get to a place where I feel like it's truly now 
a reflection of me. Right. Um, which, you know, um, feels good. Yeah. Uh, but it, you know, was definitely Hard tough. Work. It is a lot of work. Yeah. And not to mention the worst time for startups oh. since yeah. the 99, 2000 <laughs> period can't be fun. Yes. You yes. guys had to lay some people off like we, we did. did. We and did. It's brutal yeah. to yeah. have to resize yeah. and, and change the team. Yeah. Um, I just got an alert that the shirt appy guy, shirt T app guy, is on hold. Oh. Send him through. Let's, Let's talk to this guy. guy. Let's get this guy, yeah. And these things are going to go up on this next, so. Uh, Great. Hello, this is Jimmy Wales' office. May I help you? Hello, this is Charles. Charles, hi. You're speaking with Jimmy Wales? How's it going? Good. No, hey, it's Jason. Yeah. I, 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 your, your voice all confused me at first. I was like, I don't, Jimmy Wales, my website, I don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> but I'll make that sound. Um, so, uh, you made an application called Shirt T App. Shirty. Right. And it's shirtyapp.com. And tell right. us, what is this application? You, I mean, you basically get a free plug because you did such amazing work on these things. What is it? Uh, the idea is uh, custom t shirts on the go. So you can create a custom t shirt, order it, pay for it uh, from your iPhone. So uh, photographs from your phone, take a photograph, text and graphics, all right from anywhere you are with your phone. Can I just tell you something right now? Yeah. It's genius. So you're saying I could take a picture of my daughter or my dog and then ship it to you and make a t-shirt. Exactly. That is awesome. How did you come up with that idea? It is so brilliant. Well, I've been in the, I, I've been an, an, uh, an Apple fanboy for a long time. And, uh, and I've been in the t-shirt business for about three and a half years. And I, I just thought, gosh, it'd be awesome to find a way to make an application. And, uh, so we uh, we found um, I have um, some, some contacts and some friends in the, in the uh, Phoenix area who have a company called Integrum, and they do uh, custom uh, mobile applications. And ah. we met up, and, and uh, so they're building the app for us, and uh, we're really close to submitting to Apple for uh, for approval. Oh, so it's not an Apple yet. What, what's your not story? You're, are, you, are you an entrepreneur or something? You you said you had a T-shirt business yes. before this. Yes. Yeah, we started, uh, my business partner and I started a t-shirt company in Tempe, Arizona, three and a half years ago called Brand X Custom T-Shirts huh. um, on Mill Avenue in downtown Tempe, right next to ASU. So we, our whole business model is based around the custom one-off t-shirt. So oh. we're doing basically what Cafe Press is doing, but we're doing it in a retail setting. So you come into the store, and we have a selection of fonts and graphics that you can come and create your own design. And so we print any quantity. So if you want to make a shirt for yourself, put oh, that my... something amazing on it, or yeah. uh, whatever, so... That is so genius. What does it cost to make one of these shirts? I see it's American Apparel, which means that's got to be a what a fifteen dollars shirt from the get go. Right. Well, we're actually we're actually doing a similar brand, American Apparel. Um, we uh, it's called uh, Tool Sex, and they're the same kind of cut. Um, uh, and so, but it, it's a little bit cheaper than American Apparel, so we are. But it's the same exact quality and same exact cut. We can offer the shirt at a lower price. The price point starts at fourteen dollars. You get a, a shirt with text on it um, starting at fourteen dollars. Um, really? And wow. It ranges between between like fourteen and twenty five dollars for a for a t shirt. Yeah. Uh, are these like iron on? What's the technology? Uh, we call it plop printing. It's, it's a heat transferred vinyl for the ah. for the text and graphics, and then a full color transfer process for the uh, for the photographs. And so you made these one off shirts, uh, very creative. Who did the design on these? Uh, my business partner, both and I, collaborated on uh, on the different designs. And you're uh, fans of the show or something? Did somebody who watches the show say, "Hey, you should do some"? I've, I've been watching the show since since it started, so um, I'm actually more. I just I'm an audio audio guy, so I'm always, I put a podcast in and listen to it when I'm good. working. I'm driving. Right. Awesome. Well, you sent four shirts, and I want to keep them all for myself, but uh, I I think I'm going to give them to the audience. And Tyler is really pissed off, but Tyler wants a set of these shirts. Can can any, can anybody just buy these shirts at Brand X store or something? Oh, How can people buy these? Buy I planning on I, I, I reserved for myself a twist t, uh, twistshirts.com okay and I'm gonna set up a little simple a really simple uh, uh, shopping cart there so people can actually and I'm gonna upload them people could actually could uh, could uh, buy them from there uh, perfect so, and so Tyler gets a, right Tyler gets what like a two percent royalty or something <laughs> yeah I think you probably should right I think Tyler should get like a three percent royalty. I mean, these yeah. things are going to sell like need, hotcakes. We need to have a, We need like a, the logo for for inside some Tyler or something to put up yeah. there too. Absolutely, uh, make it. Um, yeah. This is uh, the entrepreneurial show, and I think we just took your website down because so many people went to it. Um, I am going to give these four shirts away to somebody who says, 
thank you to our sponsors. Everybody knows the sponsors' names. At Bing, at DNA Mail, at Ustream, at WebSpy, and at PowerVPS. Those are the five you need to say thank you to. Thanks, at Bing, DNA Mail, at Ustream, at WebSpy, at PowerVPS for supporting This Week in Startups. Put the pound twist hashtag on there. And uh, do you have a... Um, uh, uh, a, 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 a Twitter account, the handle? Yes, at Shirty App. Okay, and then at Shirty App. You can at, at Shirty App. Whoever uh, thanks the audience, whoever thanks them, I am going to uh, um, go ahead and give you one of these shirts. We have four of them, so four people get to win. Always thank the sponsors. It is your Geary to do so. Uh, let me thank you again, Charles, for doing this. It's very cool of you. And very entrepreneurial of you. Uh, this business, you're going to raise money for this business, the, the uh, Shirty App business, or is that's, it? well, it's actually a, it's actually a larger plan to be kind of become. We have retail, we have we'll have the mobile application, and we're really close to having our web app. So we're having to we're going to have a, a our company will based upon three three points of revenue: retail, web, and mobile application. Ah. So uh, there is there's a bigger there's a bigger plan in place here, and we're just trying to pull it together. So um, I actually found your show by talking to a, a really uh, great op- entrepreneurial gal named uh, Francine Hardaway here in Phoenix, and uh, she turned me on to your show awesome. uh, because I was uh, talking to her about finding uh, funding eventually for my company. Great. Uh, well, we don't have Open Angel Forum in uh, Phoenix yet, but people have pinged me about the possibility of it. Uh, we just had Boulder. So a lot we, of great yeah, good. A lot of entrepreneurship here in, in Phoenix. It's, it's awesome. Awesome. Okay. Uh, well, thank you for uh, the shirts. We're going to give those away to uh, the users. Hopefully, you can send a couple more here for Tyler and myself. Uh, I will. As many as you send, we will give away. And uh, okay. thanks again. And uh, good luck with your business. And uh, can I ask? Um, we just. Oh, so anyway, I'll, I'll let you go. Thanks a lot. Okay. Cheers. Bye. We have a new social media ninja here. Is that correct? We have somebody working here who's got the title of social media ninja. So we have Kenny Chen, the professor, I think they call him. Mm-hmm. Is he called the professor on yeah. Kevin Pollock's show? And I, why, why don't we have the um, video of the crew out there? Do we have a crew cam outside? I would like to take that from Kevin Pollock's show. Can we put the crew cam up or no? We have no crew cam? Okay, no problem. So we have uh, Kenny Chen. Then you have Emily, who just started, took over for Alex to do an excellent job. And then there is a social media ne- social media ninja. Natasha, who's working here. So we got three people working here at This Weekend Studios, which is a separate company. It's not Mahalo. This Weekend.com is a separate company. CEO going to be running that company, probably going to raise a little bit of money for it, spin it out. My show's part of it, but I'm not the CEO. Uh, and she is uh, responsible for all the tweets and the Facebook, so you got to get to know Natasha uh, at This Weekend.com. I think it's Natasha at This, at this Weekend. Emily is at This Weekend.com. And there's a show after this one, and there was a show before this one. We did This Week in Twitter before my show, mm-hmm. and after the show, we're doing This Week in Android. That's three This Week in shows in th- three weeks, and you're doing This Week in Insights. I like it. This Week in Insights. All right, let's go to the <laughs> news segment. Everybody loves the news segment. Let's bring in Lon, Lonnie Donnie. Lonnie Donnie. Oh, Lon is looking so sharp in his <laughs> blazer. Lon looking so good with his blazer. I do what I can. What happened with the hair gel? You used to have a little hair gel. Used to t- it used to be tight. Now it's poof. You know, I got. I just went and got a haircut last week, and, and they left it real poofy. I thought I told them nice. to the take it all off. You like the, you like the poofy? I like it. It's a good look. All right, fair yeah. enough. You look good. Thank you. How was Sundance? Welcome back. Oh, yeah, Sundance was a lot of fun. We only got to see a couple films because it's so, you have to really get in hustle. line for hours and really hustle around town. And, yeah. Uh, but we got two great films. Both the movies I saw were really good. What was your good. favorite film? Uh, the first one we saw was called Blue Valentine. The Weinsteins have picked it up, so it's going to come out. Um, amazing. Amazing. Good. Ryan Gosling and Michelle Williams, uh, and it's sort of, you see them as they meet and fall in love, and then you flash forward to five years and you see their sort of marriage hitting a rough patch, and you oh, switch back and forth. It was really well done. The old juxtaposition. Yes, so right, so you're literally seeing the it's the memento. It's the memento of marriage. Yeah, it's sort of like the memento of marriage. Is that not backwards? You just switch, all, switch back and forth. Let me ask you, since you're here, and we're going to turn this into This Week in Film for a second. Oh, um, love it. Why is The Hurt Locker not winning anything? Shouldn't that win Best Picture or Best Director? 
or it, best actor? I, my two favorite films this year were Inglorious Bastards and Hurt Locker. So it's I would be happy nothing. to see either of them win. Uh, I think Bigelow's still in the running for director, and she's won a lot of critics' awards. There was, right. I want to say it was the L.A. Critics. Uh, it swept. Where it was right. Hurt Locker, Best oh, Picture, good. Renner, Best Actor, Bigelow, oh, uh, LA Best film Director. Critics. Well, that's because L.A. Film Critics is actually film critics who understand film. Right. I As mean, opposed to Go Golden Globes giving the Best Picture to Avatar. Well, I think, you know, absurd. part of it, uh, Avatar was not the greatest film. It was a great spectacle, not the greatest film. But I think... Great trailer for a movie. I mean, for a video <laughs> game. I think that and a certain, when a movie becomes so popular, I think they want to acknowledge how popular, how big of a boost it gave the sort of industry. And I think that there's always a temptation to pick the juggernaut. I mean, I think the same thing happened in Titanic. Looking back... I wouldn't say Titanic was the best film of 1997. No, but they gave Dances with Wolves the best picture over Goodfellas. I mean, it makes no yes, sense. No, I don't understand the there's Academy. There's tons of occasions like that where they gave like the obvious. So who's going to win for movie. best picture then? I think it's going to be Avatar. I have to say, I think oh. I think there's a chance Avatar will get best picture and Bigelow will get best director. I saw though. Up in the Air last night. What did you think of that? I did not like Up in the Air. I Everybody felt it was a little it. bit. Um, uh, it was just a little bit too preachy about oh my god we're laying people off and. It's also just, just so on the nose. I mean, every single conversation is like, you know, life's better when you have company. It's like, I, I get it. I get that that's the theme you're going for. You don't have to really, like, kill me with it every yeah. single scene. Well, a little well, subtlety. I think Jason Reitman is a, a deft filmmaker. Like, he makes a good film. I'm not I, saying it's the best story. Of I, he just he seems to do a good film that you can nod to and enjoy. Popcorn film. Thank you for smoking. And this one, both enjoyable films for the masses. I think he's better. The, he, the material is so much for him. If he's starting off with great material, he can make a good film. I think Juno is a great example. Great script by Diablo Cody. Fun movie. When the material is not so great or he's generating it himself, eh, I'm, not, I'm not as into it. Tyler, any, uh, any, uh, what's yeah. your pick for best picture? Uh, I'm more concerned about best documentary, which is going to be The Cove. It got on the nomination... I, I think the Cove has a very good chance of getting. Looks like the Cove is going to win it. And you're, I know that you're into you're, uh, spent some time living in Japan. Mm -hmm. This is a film about killing dolphins. Um, yeah, it's not no, so much. A, yeah, it is related to killing dolphins, but I don't want people <laughs> to be turned off from watching because they think it's going to be. It's not two hours of dolphin no. slaughter. No, is what you're saying. Right. But uh, you you seem to have an affinity for this film. Yes. This film is incredible. Yeah, I go into his office, he's got 10 copies of the film. <laughs> yes. Yes. He's become a major I'm promoter. I haven't seen him this passionate about something since uh, the chai latte is at yeah, you know, <laughs> Starbucks. Yeah, it's because, well, really it's because it's about an issue that can be solved in ah, Japan. Like this it. could actually stop as opposed to the mm. rainforests and, you know, global warming and everything. This is a, a this dolphin issue can be effectively solved very quickly if enough pressure is put in the right ways, which I think if it wins the best documentary film mm. it very well might uh, help and it, everyone who watches the film can actually get involved you know what you guys should do on sunday yeah you should do a live stream here mm -hmm. during the oscars super bowl i mean this, this uh, sunday? i meant the stupid bowl yeah uh dur you can do it during the super bowl too you should sit in here oh you mean during the oscar ceremony during the oscar ceremony and during the stupid bowl mm -hmm. you should sit in here and talk about the super bowl commercials live just <laughs> chatting with right. the audience and sure. you should do the Oscars and just chat. Or you should have Kevin Pollack sit in here and do a live Kevin Pollack riffing on the Oscars. That would be Man, genius. That was, that's a good idea. Because he did that on Twitter last year and it was pretty right. funny. It's always funny when people are sort of live. Comedians are like live tweeting while yeah. you're watching the show. That's always good. All right. So there's a little uh, six-minute side uh, venture. Uh, Scott, you're sitting here going, what the hell happened to the show? Uh, <laughs> I just want to see Crazy Heart. I've heard it's great. So it I is. I've heard great things about Crazy Heart. Yeah. Crazy it's Heart. Old. It's a very small movie. It probably wouldn't have gotten a ton of attention without the acting awards, but it's it's great. Very, yeah. extremely realistic. I hear Kurt Russell's yeah. amazing. Jeff Bridges. I know it's Jeff Bridges. <laughs> 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 I heard... The war scene's great. 50-something yeah. yeah. 50 <laughs> actor who's it been be, unappreciated. Kurt Russell needs a part like that, though. No, he he's does. a great actor. And right. he gets... People don't really recognize it because he did so many, like, Tango but and Cash type movies. He has that overboard. <laughs> he should do, that, his, that he should do Escape from Austin, Texas during South by Southwest. <laughs> uh, are you going to South by Southwest? I'm not going to that. All right, you, let's you go to the me. news. We, ha we have a limited amount of time for the news. And this week in Android is starting at 3 o'clock, correct? Yes, I believe so. Is it starting at 3 or 2.30? It says 3. Okay, good. We give, we give two-hour slots here. Got it, got it, got it. Okay. Uh, yes, yeah, so let's go. Um, first story... 
TechCrunch writer accepting bribes. A 17-year-old intern who is working for TechCrunch oh. has been busted for asking for and taking bribes in exchange for posts on the popular tech blog. TechCrunch had declined to state the intern's name, but of course it was widely known and disseminated within moments of the post going up. Uh, Loic Lemure was quick to offer advice on Twitter, quote, go ahead and recognize everything that needs to be recognized and write a public apology as fast as possible. Don't wait, do it now. So the question is one, do you think following that advice could really rehabilitate this guy's career? Um, and also a question I had, should TechCrunch name the companies that offered this kid or gave this kid bribes? Okay, uh, small disclaimer, Mike Arrington and I are partners in the TechCrunch 50 conference. We've been friends for four or five years. Uh, this is a terrible situation. If you're a publisher, this is the worst situation you could ever have. This is the Jason Blair moment. Mm -hmm. It sucks. And it just shows how vulnerable as a publisher you are. One bad apple can do serious damage to a publication. Mm -hmm. And uh, every story written about TechCrunch going forward about on an editorial basis, mm -hmm. uh, probably three out of four, four out of five will mention this. Just like when people write about the New York Times on an editorial basis, that scandal comes up. Jason Blair comes up. Yes. So really, uh, Daniel, um, he's a young kid. He's 17 or something like that. But he's not a kid anymore. When we met him, he was 15. Now he's 17. He's more like an adult than a kid, frankly. Uh, he obviously knew what he was doing was wrong. Uh, extortion is a pretty serious thing. I mean, it's kind of deliberate when you think about it. Like, deliberately asking people, yeah. like, give me a MacBook Air. I will write about you. Thing. I mean, yeah, it's it's very. I mean, it's it's way over the line. Right. You read his apology. He says, like, oh, I think I crossed the line. You're like, it's it's obvious that yeah. that that's crossing the line. So uh, you asked the question, should you know, should they disclose what companies uh, were involved yeah, well, that, in this? Yes, there are. What I t I texted with Mike Arrington today, just you know, a little bit of support back and forth. Like, hey, I know this is a tough time. Keep your chin up. My advice to him, of course, is to disclose everything. Open kimono. Sunlight will kill all of the ills. Uh, but for this kid, who I sent him a personal email, I told him that I'm very disappointed in him because I've known him for a couple of years. He's at the TechCrunch 50 conference every year. And I told him that, you know, the reason this is particularly bad for him is because the people who gave him his chance in life, Mike Arrington, Heather uh, Hardy, and TechCrunch, and the fellow workers there, are the ones who are going to bear the brunt of this. Yeah. Not him. He'll be forgotten. He'll go on to his next gig or whatever. Probably won't be a journalist ever again. That's for sure. I mean, nobody's going to hire him to be a journalist ever again. <laughs> yeah, I think uh, that's pretty doubtful. Although, I guess people could do it for the sensationalistic part, but it's not even as sensationalistic as a Jason Blair where somebody might use it as a freak show to have Jason Blair as a commentator on media ethics or something. <laughs> like, um, So, Mike, Heather, and all these people who are his co-workers, and they're going to have to then suffer because of what he did. And it's not a reflection of TechCrunch, who have great writers, uh, MG... Uh, Robin, Eric, Jason. Eric, Jason. I mean, these guys all pour and gals pour their hearts into that thing every day as a journalist, and it's just heartbreaking to then you get examined on the same lens as him, and everybody's going to be making jokes for the next two or three years. Oh my God, you know, mm -hmm. can I come by for a press tour? I'm going to bring a MacBook Air with me. You know, it's, it's going to be <laughs> yeah. an ongoing joke, and this happens right after the the tech the Crunchpad lawsuit. It's just. It's like I feel bad when your friend has a string of bad luck. Yeah. Um, but Mike's a strong guy, and he will get through it. Um, but it is very, it's very bad. It, at, least, at least he wasn't asking for one of those crunch pads. That <laughs> he's demanding yeah, a crunch pad. Well, that's a, that was sort of my joke about it was you know like I have a MacBook Air. I wouldn't even play Hulu without skipping. I don't think that this is the. <laughs> if you're going to extort somebody, get a Tesla. Yeah. Um, but no, I mean they they, they immediately turned <laughs> off all their posts, all of his posts, and I guess they're, what they're probably doing right now is an investigation. Yeah. Did, well. this, did he get, you know, is it two paid posts? Which it seems like there's one he, they know he did and there's one that... Yeah, he, according to the TechCrunch post... It post, seems like there's two. There's at least at least at two. At least two. Because it says there's one that they caught him In the making process. this offer and right. hadn't received anything. And there's another one they know that he actually exchanged goods in order for a... Right placement on TechCrunch. So then what is number three, four, five, and six? Or right. is there? And that's probably what they're trying to figure out. Now for the companies who did this... If a, if a company of note did something like this, then it starts getting into, like, a whole other level of scandal. Well, then I think you really do. We The public has a right to know what companies out there are buying Coverage. press. Yeah. Yes. Absolutely. So if you, ha God forbid, it was, you know, a top company was trying to buy coverage, ugh. You know, then it becomes, yeah. like, those scandals where in Germany they were doing, some of the companies in Germany were doing, uh, like, 
I think it was some of the car companies, I can't remember, somebody could Google it or Bing it, uh, they were actually had bribes as part of their balance sheet, like they were bribing people in other countries for contracts. <laughs> and then the German government was like, what is this? You know, they got, <laughs> and they got in a lot it's of trouble. Bad, so anyway, it's loud. terrible. Uh, Daniel, I'm a little bit concerned about uh, because he clearly does not understand exactly why this is a problem. Because, you, like you said, I have his, um, I have his, uh, his, uh, his blog, his DanielBrew.com, B R U. Daniel Brew, and, and okay. he says the line was crossed. I mean, it's just like it's. This looks like President Clinton wrote it or something. You know, it's like I mean, when you say like I crossed the line, it's like it no, you extorted people. It usually implies there's a gray area there. Yeah. I went a little too far. I admit right. it. Right. This is not it. This is I, very clear cut. Right. I could have asked for I could have asked for an you know an iPod Touch. That would have been okay. You know, like it's, it's <laughs> right. a pretty clear. It's a, it's it's a clear line. Yeah. And it's I, and what I'm trying to figure out is is it criminal? Extortion's criminal for sure. Right. I think uh, if he had uh, said, I'm going to tank you on TechCrunch unless you buy me, right. that, that, yeah, that yeah, strikes yeah, me as yeah. almost assuredly illegal. Uh, if it's, you know, give me a computer and I'll write something nice about you, it's definitely unethical. I don't know what the law, um, the law uh, Well, would be. okay, could TechCrunch sue him for damaging their brand? Hmm. They'd have to prove damages. Well, <laughs> that's pretty easy I to think do. they could show I mean, that it definitely hey, affected who, their Ask Ask 100 people, do you yeah. think less of TechCrunch because of this? 100 people no, raise I mean, their hand. They'd have to have a line item new numbers of here's how much this we lost this ad account right. or whatever. Yeah. yeah, you have to prove damages yeah, yeah. For, for that kind of thing. But I bet they'd be able to show financial harm. I think so, yeah. And, but the other crazy thing is in his post of apology, and this is what I sent to him an email, he's promoting his conference, Teens in Tech, yes, which, which is tonight, is really I guess. So he's going to show his face tonight? And just as, cool. it, it seems like... Yeah, that's wow. going to be... It's kind that's of gonna be audacious. Ugly. That's, it's very audacious. I noticed that, too, that, yeah, he links <laughs> and he discusses, like, I'm still doing this thing tonight. And, yeah, he February should not 6th. be doing that. And he's doing it at Google. And so Google is going to allow him to do this there? I mean, it's, this is going to be a fiasco. Can you imagine? And look <laughs> they, at all the sponsors <laughs> of it. <laughs> they were a customer, apparently. Yeah, yeah no, but look, oh. Uh, hey, oh. Oh. Uh, look, at the, uh, look at the sponsors. He's got Charles River EA Ventures, Google, and EA, and Intel. I mean, yeah, Best Buy. Uh, Best Buy, Spec. I mean, he's got all these incredible, JBL. I mean, he's got all these incredible people sponsoring. And, I mean, yes. wait a second. Is this tomorrow? The 6th, yeah. Oh, so it's tomorrow. Tomorrow night. Yeah. And so, yeah, this is not a good situation. Um, he, it's the he, worth. The timing is not great for him. <laughs> well, this, I, that makes you wonder, was there something going on where the person who had this evidence or whatever did this to tank him right the day before this? Um, but I, uh, of course, I'm going to stay in my guy's corner and support him. And uh, my only advice is just every piece of information you can put out there. And... To, to Daniel's parents, if he's still, I, I mean, you're 17, you're still. Well, I was, but I also wasn't hosting tech conferences. No, so no, but when know. you're 17, you're or you're not legally an adult in California. I think it's a question for the chat know. room to go look. Ask yeah. it on Mahalo Answers. But are you a legal adult think, at 17? Like, I think is he? So, I actually, think 17 I think, is. I think, the, I think so 16 is. Yeah. So I was going to say, I was, you know, for his parents, you know, you got to. This kid's got to go to therapy and talk about this thing. But, I mean, as an adult, he needs to go to therapy and talk to some person who's qualified. I mean, I should have Mark Goulston talk to him and say, like, you know, like, you've you got to work through this because you have some serious, um, uh, this says, no, you're not, 18, huh? Everybody's hmm. So, I mean, his parents uh, and he have to go and talk this out with a therapist or a counselor or something. Why did you do this? What was your thinking? And go make amends with the people who you've wronged. What's his way out of this? Like, what would you coach yeah, him? Like, what would what you say to him? How, like, how what is the next move I, when you've done I something am, like this? Well, I don't, I'm not an expert on this stuff. I was a yeah. psychology under, uh, undergraduate. Cool. But I do know that when you do something wrong, uh, confessing and going through all the details with a person who you did wrong by mm -hmm. and hearing from them and subjecting yourself to hearing from them how they were hurt by your actions. I know that in Alcoholics Anonymous or in drug, I've seen these drug rehab programs where they do that when they have, you know, like, some therapy to get people off drugs or whatever. People come in and say, this is what, how your drug abuse has affected the family. Right, like so, in the intervention. Like in an intervention. So they do ha he has to go and sit with Mike and Heather. At some point, if Heather and Mike will ever do it and forgive him, and he has to sit there and say, listen, this is what I did. This is what I was thinking at the time. This is why it's wrong. I realize that now. I am very sorry for the damage to cause you sincerely. And look them in the eyes and say, I'm really sorry. This is the worst thing I've ever done in my life. And if there's any way I can make up to, it, I w to you, I would like to do that. 
and I know that there is no way I can make it up to you, but I just want to let you know that I want to try. Hmm. Whatever way that is possible. And he needs to hear from them, yeah. either F you, I never want to see you again, and he, or he has to hear from them, yes, I accept your apology, but it's critical for him to reconcile with those people. And he really, I'll tell you a story. When I was, is it, this was a seminal moment in my life, one of the seminal moments in my life. I was 12 years old, 11 or 12 years old, and I used to sweep up my father's bar in the mornings on Saturday and Sunday. And this is in Brooklyn, mm -hmm. and he had video games, arcade games, in the place. I got addicted to playing Defender. It's a good game. And I took some quarters from the register. I played Defender. I needed more quarters. I was in a Defender frenzy. <laughs> <laughs> so I knew they kept like a bag with 25 rolls of quarters, you know, behind the ice machine or whatever. So I went in there and I took a quarter off each roll. That I kept playing the games. That's a clever way to do it. You didn't take a whole. No, roll. Of course. I, I was involved in all kinds of scams and everything else. But, <laughs> so I, kn I knew how to do this kind of yeah, stuff. Uh, yeah. So. <laughs> It, it is a very, a very serious story. And then I took a couple more, and then I called it a day. I get a call from my dad. I'm firing Billy Murphy. And I was at my grandparents' house, because I used to do the porter. We, they called it porter work then, mm -hmm. janitor. Yeah. My Irish grandfather and I used to go to church at 6 a.m., and then we'd go clean this place up at 7 a.m. And we'd do that Saturday and Sunday. Every Saturday and Sunday from the age of 9 years old to 15 years old, I did this at my dad's bar. And... I'm at my grandparents. Grandma's making me lunch at 11 o'clock. My dad calls, says, Billy Murphy was my favorite person. He's the bartender. He says, I got to fire Billy Murphy. I just wanted to let you know. I said, what? what? Why? And he said, firing Billy Murphy because he stole money from the bar. I said, really? And he said, yeah. We, Billy Murphy took quarters from the register and from all the quarters in the back thing. It's stealing. It's wrong. We're, we're going to fire him. So I just want you to say goodbye to him. Mm -hmm. And I just, I, I turned white. I felt this <laughs> emptiness in my body, like the feeling you feel if so, you find out somebody's died that you loved or something, just this total emptiness. And I said, I did it. And I started crying. He goes, well, you have to go and apologize to him right now. My dad picked me up. He stopped what he was doing, picked me up, mm -hmm. brought me to the restaurant at 1 o'clock. Billy Murphy came out. And I started hysterical crying. I took the quarters. <laughs> Billy Murphy put his arm around me, took me around the corner. We sat on a, on a bench. I sat there and cried for an hour. And he said, listen, it's okay. You made a mistake. I'm not being fired. Hey, my dad's going to fire you. I was like shaking. <laughs> it was incredible. Yeah. And I never stole again. I knew that was so wrong and that there were ramifications of stealing. My dad, I, you could say that was the most torturous, craziest thing you could ever do to a kid traumatizing but you know what that traumatized me in the right way right it was and and i think that daniel hasn't had that moment yet he hasn't been taken mm -hmm. to billy murphy to see <laughs> the ramification of what he did he could potentially take down TechCrunch with this behavior if it, let's say this whole thing blows up to some huge scandal it, it could be it could destroy mike's work over the last five six seven years whatever he's been doing this i mean it's huge ramifications and i'm very concerned about this kid because if he goes to this thing tomorrow and he gets booed on stage or whatever, somebody, you know, God forbid, whatever happens. I mean, this is serious stuff, and he, he needs to talk to somebody about it, and he needs to be set straight, and that's how I would do it. I would put him in front of Mike Arrington and have Mike Arrington explain, like Billy Murphy did to me, like, I need, and Billy Murphy, oh, so Bill, adding to it, Billy Murphy said, I need to put my kids through school. I need to pay my rent. I can't afford to lose this job. If your dad fired me, I wouldn't, I'd have to move out of my house. You know, he, he yeah. laid it on thick, too. It was traumatizing. And I don't think... <laughs> yeah. I mean, I, I'm visib you can tell yeah. I'm visibly, yeah. like, remembering the story. It, it gets mm -hmm. very emotional for me. Very uh, serious situation. He needs to go sit with Mike Arrington in a closed room, maybe with another party there or not, and Heather, and have them talk about how much work they put into TechCrunch and how much bullshit... You can bleep that out, two hours, 52 minutes. How much BS they're going to have to deal with because of this. I mean, this is going to seriously damage TechCrunch on a revenue basis. Yeah. On an, you know, this is not a joke. No. 
But, I mean, I feel like he may have had that moment today, seeing the entire internet talking about. What and he I don't want to give him. I don't want to give him a hard time because you know what? I'm I'm afraid the kid might hurt himself or something. And God forbid. I mean, when this hits him. Yeah, seventeen is young too. I mean, I think that's thing you got to remember. That's I mean, like he's been sort of thrust into this the very limelight. adult world and this yes. very professional environment. And I don't know if I. I don't think I would have done something like this. But at seventeen, I wasn't really ready to be like a professional. I'm barely ready now. It's a very good point and something people should recommend. Kids got to be kids. And, you know, I'm all big into entrepreneurship and it's cool that, you know, we joke about kids, you know, going on to be entrepreneurs on this program. But, you know, he grew up a little too fast and he got so much press and so much limelight. From the time he was, what, 14, 15? Uh, Yeah, I met him. When was the first time we met him, Tyler? Three or four years ago? So, yeah, it was three years ago. Uh, The whole thing is just very upsetting to me. Let's go to the next story. Next story. Uh, Unless anybody else has something to add to this. Tyler, is something. No, not right. I, it just <laughs> it it casts a shadow over, you know, this even the conference he's at. It's like so the people that are participating in the conference. Did he play any weird games? That's just who, <laughs> you know, you've opened up a whole can of worms on yourself. Yeah. Which I yeah. I mean, it also affects me. I mean, TechCrunch fifty now. I'm going to gasp about that. That was my point. It's like so. Thankfully, he's not like vetting the companies that come into TechCrunch fifty. Yeah. Maybe this year. You know, he had developed enough at the te- on their side. Where somebody says I'm exaggerating here. I don't, I yeah. don't know. I, 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 I say I don't think you are because as someone who's I don't have a relationship with Mike. I right. know him professionally and respect yeah. what he does. And TechCrunch is obviously uh, a great publication. But my first thought was, who else is doing this? Right. Like, it's not fair. I, I, I mean, I'm not. I'm right. not. I'm not saying that there's any. But that's the first thing that's in my mind is like, okay, well, is this beyond this one? Yeah, kid. Yep. Is it is it broader than that? And that's completely unfair. I confess that it's completely unfair. Oh, but that's what your but, mind naturally but, goes. But that, I'm of just course, saying, yeah. like, Jason it's Blair not, comes out. That's the first thing you think of is yeah. who else is yeah. lying so the paper. I, you know, I would, you know, disagree that it's not being blown up proportion because that's not right. <laughs> I know? don't know. What do you guys think? Uh, so somebody here, Nick three six five, says he thinks Arrington should have dealt with this privately. It would have gotten out. It's not realistic to say that he should have done it privately. Um, if he could have, I'm sure he would have. Uh, this happens every day. There's a cynic saying that, Mickey. Um, and this person is saying, that's the first thing on my mind, and that's what uh, will damage the TechCrunch brand, which, to your point, Scott. Mm-hmm. Um, it is getting blown up because he is 17, of course. But no, no, actually, I think this would be worse if he was an adult. Oh, I, I, I do, too. A thousand I think, times I think worse. There are I think a lot of people. Because I think there are a lot of people saying, well, he's yeah. a kid. Yes. You know, he didn't understand. If this was a 30-something-year-old person... They would be far more rancorous. Andy Ferris sums it up nicely. This kid needs to get off the bitch train and man up. <laughs> I'll leave it at that. There you go. Uh, next story, please. Next story, Quedit. Quedit is a new payment service for online games that defiantly refuses to guarantee its payments. It's K-W-E-D-I-T. Uh, here's the idea. Users who want credits on virtual goods, like, mm. say, you're playing Farmville or something, uh, you go to Quedit, you take out a loan, you're promising to pay back, like, I want... $10 on Bejeweled, and then it records the your loan uh, that was taken, but there's no real penalty if you don't pay it back. You just ruin your virtual credit score, and you can't keep using the system. Genius. So the idea is a lot of people who can't spend money on casual games, they don't have a credit card, they'll start spending credit, uh, and the company's also hoping that this helps you avoid online scams. If you get scammed, you didn't spend your own money, you spent some credit, so you lost some credit, but there you go. So you can dispute it. Right. Plus, they make it really easy to pay if you do decide to pay off your debts. You can go to any 7-Eleven and pay there. You can mail in a cash payment. And you can even, they call it passing the duck, email to your friends and say, hey, I took $5 of credit out. Somebody help me throw them 5 bucks. Help me pay it back. Um, so thoughts, and do you think people will actually pay them back? Um... Sure, some people will. Most won't, but they're prob- nobody's going to use this to sell iPods. They're going to use it to sell virtual coin that has no get money value anyway. Mm-hmm. And if you have to turn off your bejeweled high scores and your Facebook account, that's a little bit of a bummer, so maybe you'll have some incentive to pay it back. Uh, so there is a certain amount of lockup when you have a virtual character or something. It's the Woofy Bank in some ways, which was a TechCrunch 50 company where they right. were saying, like, make a, a virtual currency based on reputation. But they're saying, here is have a reputation system, I guess. In some ways, right. Well, so I mean, you will lose, you will ruin your credit rating if you right. take out a lot of loans. And I think they have a set number where if you take out this amount of credit and you don't pay anything back, right. you just basically shut. So down basically, your what they're doing is they're they're extending credit, they're giving loans mm-hmm. uh, with a limit. The limit of the loan, if it's five or ten dollars, can't really hurt Zynga or you know 
Farmville. It can't hurt them. Well, so the, why not get people to try and it? the benefit to them is, yeah, all these people who would just not bother, well, I don't have a credit card, I can't yeah. buy anything here. They're growing your market. Yeah, I mean, it's growing the market. even 5% of them it's give brilliant. it a try. That's right. It's, it's brilliant, brilliant, brilliant for that reason. It's getting the piece of the market that won't participate to participate. Yeah. And if they don't pay, they weren't part of your market anyway. Yeah, I thought it was so it's gravy. pretty ingenious idea. It's pretty ingenious idea, although it's pretty stupid in some ways, but genius in another. Uh, <laughs> But, yeah. Stupid in the best way possible. It's like stupid in the best way, exactly. Yeah. And it's. Um, I'm impressed you could say that over and over and not fumble your words. Credit, yeah. That, that, that was really impressive. At I least I don't have to say credit cards. Yeah. The that crazy thing up. is they they raised three million dollars for this concept, but I guess they're going for the whole virtual currency play in general. Yes. Who put money in? Who's that? Uh, I'm I'm trying to pull up Crunchbase here. I don't, I don't um, know if I put that in my. I don't. I didn't put that in my. News. Yeah. I mean, I. It's so funny because now every time we go to talk about something, I think of a Daniel. <laughs> Joe to me. Yeah. You know, oh, put money in. Oh. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Uh, if you send him a MacBook Air. Yeah. yeah. Uh, it was True forever. Ventures, uh, which is a good company, and Kapoor and Fenwick and West, which is a law firm and Endeavor. Well, I think the um, idea is you you can use it just as a sort of payment system. You can pay in a credit card, and you can mm -hmm. use this just like PayPal. But yeah. So that this is using like their hook. This is their hook. Okay. Next story. Next story, uh, Apple may be banning location-based ads. Apple has posted a warning to its iPhone app creators and developer forums, suggesting that they cease submitting apps that make use of lo user location just to target advertising. The notification reads, if you build your application with features based on a user's location, make sure these features provide beneficial information. If your app uses location-based information just to enable mobile advertisers to develop targeted ads based on a user's location, your app will be returned to you by the App Store review team for modification before it can be posted to the App Store. Hmm. So is this an example of Apple actually looking out for their customers, ensuring apps only ask <laughs> your location if they are going to help you, or is there some other kind of hidden agenda, an attempt to control how you use their platform? Bing, bing, bing. Yeah, <laughs> what do you think, Scott? <laughs> I, I think it's got to be the latter. Mm -hmm. I, I, um, yeah, I, what's the downside? I, what's the downside I, to, I would rather get apps that were, if they told me every ad on your iPhone is automatically geo-targeted, I'd say fine. Yep. Who cares? I don't think it's a privacy thing because they don't know. Right. It's, I'm not going to click on it anyway. Well, you're on the app and the little message comes up like, do you want this app wants to access your location? Yeah. You think you're going to get some sort of benefit right. out of that yeah. as right. opposed to just we're going to target advertising right, but more you, effectively. If, if they're giving you better targeted advertising, they can give you a better application for free. So I'm right. all for them making better yeah. targeted ads so as long as they don't screw with my privacy. I agree, yeah. Yeah, and I, I can always opt out of it by turning location services off in the main menu or mm -hmm. by not allowing it in the first place. So I think this is Apple uh, is going to regulate their ad network, and they are going to charge a carry fee for people who put ads. So they could block ad mob technically, I think, according to their terms of service. Mm -hmm. like ad, right. you, they could say any ads running through the, yeah. our system have to pay this amount per 1,000 yeah. or use our system. Yeah. So they could put a tax on it, just like Facebook is going to put a tax on Zynga and other people doing games soon, and they're going to have Facebook credits. Yeah. Um, Yep, it's coming. Fair enough. Yeah, go ahead. Next story. Yeah. Uh, oh, it's 3 p.m. We got one more story. Let's talk. We'll talk about Facebook. Yesterday was the sixth birthday of Facebook. To celebrate sixth birthday since they launched or became open to the public. I believe it's since they became open to beyond Harvard, maybe. Yeah, that's I think amazing. So. It really is. They're amazing. calling it their sixth birthday. Mm. Um, okay. This so would be it. Uh, so somebody in the chat room, check if the six-year anniversary means the six years since it was launched at Harvard for like just that edu. So I think that's when it launched. That's probably right. Yeah. Okay. It seems like it's just it was a launch, like when yeah. it went online. The Facebook back then. The Facebook. Uh, and to celebrate, the site has launched a long-awaited redesign. 80 million of its 400 million users can see it currently, or as of the time I wrote this news. Uh, the most notable change is the inclusion of notifications prominently at the top of your page, which has already been part of the iPhone app for a while. Uh, search has also been improved. You're going to see the front, your, people's names come up based on how closely related they are to you. Ah. So they're in your network, if they're friends of people in your network, and Got so it. forth. Uh, Founder Mark Zuckerberg has also promised the company will be developing new features at a faster pace, promising something cool once a month from this point forward. TechCrunch is already guessing that this may be a new featured webmail product. That's so, a no-brainer. I mean, MySpace did that, yeah. Cut. Right. So what do you think of the new redesign, if you've seen it already, and do you think they can live up to a promise of once a month something cool? Um, they can easily steal, I mean, innovate once a month. <laughs> with some, no, they can easily steal something from Twitter once a month. Right. Uh, the question is, can Twitter keep producing something interesting and worthy of Facebook stealing every month? I mean, they, he's, Zuckerberg has become the Borg. They just take everybody else's good idea and steal it. Uh, they can, and they have a lot of cash now. 
they've got momentum, they've got 400 million users or something like that. And so, yeah, they'll, they'll steal something every day, I think. I, the question is, when are they going to do something innovative of their own again? That's my question. The last innovative thing he did was the app platform. And what, what's innovative since then? Everything else since then is stolen from Twitter uh, or another service. And I, you know, all their redesigns have to do with trying to um, beat out Twitter. I don't really see a lot of original yeah. behavior out of that company anymore. I th and that would concern me because you, know, you, you can steal your way to a certain level, but I don't think you can get to permanent success just on that alone. So I don't know. I'm not a fan right now. Right. And do you think, uh, is this going to help them move past the privacy settings fiasco? Is that dying down? Are people still upset about that? Still plenty of lawsuits going on about it from what I understand. Uh, but general public doesn't care about privacy yeah, it until seems, it gets compromised. It just seems like that, that hasn't really taken off beyond the sort of tech industry people who In general, privacy is uh, a soft issue, mm -hmm. like pollution in some ways, that people don't care about until people start reporting you know, like, oh my God, autism rates are through the roof, or you know, pe breast cancer rates are through the roof, and then all of a sudden everybody cares about pollution. But there were people watching pollution in Long Island, or you know, autism rates all over the place, and you know, it's it's when something manifests itself that's close to home for people. And what will have to happen is, I think, sadly, it's uh, they're going to have to give away people's information somehow and compromise it in order for people to care. Like people started caring about search data when. AOL released it. Right. And then it became like a front and center issue. Mm -hmm. um, what do you think? What do you think of Facebook in general? Uh, you know, I'm, I'm a fan. As a social network. No, I think it's, um, I think it's um, the leader. And I think, you know, despite Twitter's great advancements, um, I still think uh, the user base, um, the broad platform, all the various things and the features and tools, and frankly, the pace of innovation, they've done a great job. I think a phenomenal job of product development. Oh yeah, I mean just They're in terms of efficiency innovators. and getting things out. I know people have had you know disappointments and concerns about you know well you know it's always changing. I can never find anything. But um, in general, I think they're going to be very successful. Yeah, it's hard to bet against them uh, yep. with that many users, and it's hard to get bet against Power VPS. Power VPS, Power VPS. <laughs> you like that segue? Dynamite. dynamite. I love the segue. Dynamite. That's my favorite part about doing the commercials. Power VPS, <laughs> Power VPS. Oh, yes, Power VPS. Uh, Power VPS provides fully managed virtual private server hosting mm, with great customer service and an amazing price, starting as low as $59 a month. PowerVPS.com. Twist viewers get 25% off the life of their plan with discount code TWIST. So 25% for life off from our good friends at Power VPS. And guess what? The new this week in website being hosted at. Power VPS, oh, so synergy. we are using it, yes, and uh, it's supposed to be very easy to set up and use, and wow, what great prices, and they've been great to the Twist audience, producing this fine program and supporting it uh, mm -hmm. for a long time now with their two products, DNA Mail and Power VPS. We'll select the winners of the shirt uh, this afternoon. Oh, are these the Tyler uh, you saw them, right? shirts? Yes, I They're got brilliant. a preview. Amazing. 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 All right. Give us one final news story. Well, actually, to tie into the privacy thing, I have another one. The FBI wants ISPs to record lists of websites their customers have visited and to retain this information for at least two years. Yeah. The idea is that these browser and web histories could help in making cases against child pornographers and other criminal activity online. The idea is also supported by a variety of state computer crime investigators, the Department of Homeland Security, and the Immigration and Customs Enforcement Agency. So are you? Or do you think most people are willing to give up some of their privacy in order to help catch child pornographers and other sort of felons or and do you trust ISPs and the government to keep this information secure and protected uh, the government will screw this up ISPs will screw this up any information that is saved like this uh, will be compromised it gets out all it information like will all be compromised gets out always. always and uh, there's reports that the back the the reason the whole Chinese government was able or Chinese government the, the Chinese hack Whoever it was. Individuals in China who may or may not have been supported by the government. Exactly. Whatever that Chinese hack was, they got in supposedly through a back door put in by the government or at the request of the government into Gmail. Mm -hmm. So the, the irony of it is, is that our security got compromised because we compromised American security by putting in this back door, if that is in fact true. Uh, it's a terrible idea. And Americans are slowly seeing all of their rights get taken away. It will all be abused, and it will end in something like Viva Vendetta or 1984. We're turning into a police state. It's unnecessary. 
because the people who are true criminals are not going to, they're going to use encryption or a Tor server or any number of things that they'll tunnel across the ISP and all the ISPC, I, ISP is going to see is just tunneling to some other offshore account. So basically, everybody's got to give up their fri privacy and freedom and then the people who are the true criminals are not going to get caught because they're going to, they're too smart. Just libraries and universities are where well, all these people that. are Well, forget that. I mean, you, I can just pull up outside too. your house with my laptop, yeah. get on free Wi-Fi, or I can buy a, you know, free cell phone card to do that, or I can go to a library or a, or a cafe, or I can just use simple IP masking software through any of these anonymous services and it'd be fine. What should really happen is um, people should start releasing uh, uh, products that anonymize users so that it good users should start anonymizing their activities so that these things just get forgotten about people don't do it in Europe they would never allow this to happen uh, and we've got to take it more seriously as Americans and you know as scary as it is for you know things like 9-11 to happen or this dumbass who almost blew up a plane with his underwear and you didn't really even get close torching to his <laughs> it was pretty torched pathetic. his balls and whatever he did <laughs> yes Makes my um, life miserable through the security lines now. Yeah. It's unbelievable. So yeah. now we all have to suffer for, because it's this idiot doesn't know how to set up a bomb or yeah. you know put yeah. a bomb <laughs> on the thing. And everybody's on, it's just ridiculous. If somebody's going to, there's 300 people on a plane or 200 people on a plane, you could kill 200 people very easily. Yeah. There's a million ways to do it if you if you got yeah. your mindset on it. That's not going to stop it. No amount of eight dollar an hour, ten dollar an hour TSA people making a strip down to our loincloths is going to save us from an Al Qaeda or radical Muslim maniac who wants to get on a bus with a bomb. And it's the same thing with this stuff. No amount of tech, no amount of watchdogging will, will, let, will catch these guys. It's ridiculous. I don't have an opinion on it, though. <laughs> I don't feel too strongly about yeah, it. It is ridiculous. I, it, it is it's a little ridiculous. And I mean, just, you know, I, I think that more than terrorism, this one they were saying was aimed at child porn, which you would think there's a million ways to sort of Oh, if they want to catch child people, pornographers, that's doesn't require easy. them saving my browsing history. Uh, have you ever seen Law & Order? It's very easy to catch child <laughs> pornographers. I mean, it's like a Law & Order episode of Special Victims Unit every season <laughs> with that. Weeks, yeah. And it's basically like, somebody goes into a chat room and they're like, who wants to have kid? And then like, it's like, you know, 80 people show up at like, you know, a basement apartment and they all get arrested. It's so like the same uh, thing every time. They should really just hire Ice T. and he'll uh, take care no, of all they this. should hire the guy from To Catch a Predator and they'll catch as many pedophiles as yeah. they want. <laughs> Who's that guy? Chris Smith? Who's what, that guy? What is the guy? I'm Chris Hansen. Chris Hansen is the kid to catch. If they want to catch pornographer, uh, child <laughs> pornographers, just get Chris Hansen. That guy, uh, he walks down the street, the five of them follow him. To be fair, I think they're, already, the Pied Pied they're already caught when he's gone. The, the staff catches him, and then he just sits across the table like, what are you doing here? <laughs> Why are you here? I love that. It's a great show. I could watch that forever. <laughs> Only because of the reactions of... Yeah. I mean, it's very sad, obviously. Yeah, don't get yeah. me wrong. I want me to make light of a situation. But the level of stupidity in criminals is just yeah. unbelievable. Well, I like that they always... It's deny, deny, deny. And then they reach that moment where they realize, I am at genuinely yeah. busted. And then the apology begins. Like, right. Always, and then they try to explain two minutes of like, I'm going to be the first guy to get away with Unbelievable. This. Unbelievable. <sighs> it is ridiculous. And... Yeah. Uh, yeah, I mean, it's so easy. They don't, they don't need to compromise the entire country's privacy mm -hmm. to catch a predator. It's true. Chris Hansen does Chris it every Hansen week. Chris Hansen does it. Did you hear about the one guy on Chris Hansen's show who killed himself? Yes. Well, they did that South Park about it afterwards. Oh, they did a South Park on it? Yeah, you didn't see the South Park with Chris Hansen? Oh, it's genius. Oh, my God, I haven't seen that in a Why don't you take a seat right down here? They just they got him. <laughs> <laughs> they nailed him. <laughs> just, they got him. They got him beautifully. This is the crazy really story, good. though. We talk about these kamikaze things. Uh, I don't know the details of it, but I will summarize it uh, as such. Somebody can correct me in the chat room. But Chris Hansen busts a guy. He runs out. Mm -hmm. Or something like that. He went to McDonald's or something. Yeah, it was later on that later on and evening. Or yeah, well, I, I guess they busted him, interviewed him. Yeah. Then he went home and killed himself. And then they sued... Dateline or NBC? Is it NBC Dateline? Yeah, it's Dateline NBC. Uh, well, it's its own show now, I think, but it started yeah. on Dateline NBC. Yeah, so anyway. Uh, and I think they got sued and I think they settled. I don't know. Scott, thanks Sounds for like being it. here. Yeah. Congratulations on the big and acquisition of Style High. <laughs> thank you, thank you. Uh, Curate Media. Yep. And on and Twitter. And Series C, I don't think we even talked about that. And we closed a Series C. 
Oh, you close seriously. So you got more money. Got more right? money, yeah. Money's good. Yep. Blah, blah, blah. Everybody's got, you know, all these companies <laughs> are raising money. That's not a big deal. I think the style high thing is a bigger deal. You it is. You doubled your traffic footprint, yep. which is big. Yep. You got the, all that knowledge and stuff like that. Yep. Uh, we look forward to hearing about Curate Media. Absolutely. Thanks. Uh, Scott uh, Simcoe, uh, who is a super fan who blogs, will mm. be checking in with you from time to time Great. to find out what's going on with this next. Okay. You all get to read the blogs. We're trying to do a thing here where we combine the podcast with a fan blogger in between the shows. So, if you're a fan of the show, This Week in Startups, go to thisweekinstartups.com and read the posts in between. That's what we're trying to do, is to give you something, a little bit of candy in between the shows. Yeah, it's really interesting, because it goes back through all the people we've talked to on the show and like gives you little quick yeah. updates. Little, it's fun. little geek stack update yeah. or whatever. Uh, Maroon Door guy from last week. Remember the Maroon Door guy? He mm -hmm. can't stop emailing me. <laughs> really? All right, let me just give a little disclaimer to people who are on the show. If you're on the show, I'd love to help you. The show is here to help you. But I, I don't work for you after you've been on the show. <laughs> I can't introduce you to Mark Cuban or Elon Musk. Uh, I can't take you on a tour of Silicon Valley. I can't tell Mike Arrington to blog about your company, insert joke here. I, you know, it's ridiculous. I, he, he emailed me like 17 <laughs> times. I'm like, it's very cool. I'm, I'm, yeah. I hope Maroon Door is, does a huge job. But as I told him on email, when I got the seventh email, you have to do this, not me. That's what entrepreneurship is about, making it happen. The entrepreneurs who get it done are the ones who actually do it. Every journey has a first step. The most difficult one is that first step. By watching the show, you've taken the first step. Disconnect from the matrix. Start a company. Join a company. We'll see you next time on This Week in Startups. Thanks, Tyler. Spike down. I could trip a referee. Tell by my attitude that I most definitely leave from.